Good morning. Madam Minister, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, very welcome to the conference, a bouquet on the table, the legacy of Marga Klompe, Klompe for an ethical approach to healthcare and aging in a globalized world. The conference will be opened by our rector, Philip Eilander. Thanks, Miriam. Good morning. Thank you for coming to Tilburg University. Some of you come from far. We appreciate very much. Uh, special and honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear students, it's my pleasure to welcome you at Tilburg University on the occasion of this international symposium on behalf of the board of Tilburg University. We are proud to host this special symposium in honor of the 100th anniversary of the first female minister of the Netherlands, Marga Klompe, and to organize it together with the Marga Klompe Health Foundation and Coordate, and also in close cooperation with several co-organizers. The topic of today's symposium is the legacy of Marga Klompe for an ethical approach to health care and aging in a globalized world. This symposium aims to, to contribute to the exchange of knowledge and experiences between the relevant sectors in society on the one hand and academia on the other hand. It brings together organizations operating in health care in the Netherlands as well as globally in the context of an agenda of international social responsibility. And this is really a challenging and relevant agenda with lots of topics for research and education in academia. Tilburg University is proud to have the Marga Klompe Chair. This is an initiative of the Marga Klompe Foundation. Professor Miriam van Rijssen is the beholder of the chair and the main topic of her research is in the field of international social responsibility. Last Friday, we were honored at the 85th anniversary of our university with a visit to our campus from our Majesty, Majesty Queen Beatrix to reveal a statute of Marga Klompe and also with a special keynote speech of the President of Liberia, Excellency Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, the first female head of state in Africa. She gave an impressive speech on her leadership in Liberia and the relevance of international social responsibility today. Research and education in the field of international social responsibility fits very well to the device of this university, of Tilburg University, because our device is understanding society. Our research and education programs are related to topics that are relevant to global society. We believe that it's important to prepare our students and scholars for an international and multidisciplinary approach. More and more we are crossing the borders and frontiers in our research and education. We are preparing our students to think and work at a global level. And also we aim to educate them as leaders, responsible leaders for the future. Ladies and gentlemen, today's program, I saw it and I'm convinced that it's a very rich program with a lot of important topics and outstanding speakers. There's a compliment already for the initiators and organizers of this international symposium, especially Professor Miriam van Rijssen. I hope and expect you will witness a most inspiring day. Thank you for your attention. It's my pleasure to give the floor to Agnes van Adena. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Rector Magnificus. Um, dear ladies and gentlemen, Excellencies, Madam Minister Holland, um, ex Your Excellency Ambassador uh, Mary Mutiada, coming from Brussels, other guests coming from far away or from the Netherlands, close to the University of Tilburg. Uh, it's a pleasure to stand here. Uh, I think it's a year ago that we were here when we started the endowed chair of Marga Klompe with a great inauguration uh, and it was quite an event that started at that time. And we think that there is, let's say, the ground uh, why we are here around um, um, the chair, the endowed chair, of course. 
and also that we now can focus on a particular issue that binds us all worldwide, healthy aging. And as chair of the Marga Klompé Foundation, I would like to express my gratitude to the University of Tilburg for hosting this symposium, for the guest speakers, I've seen them all now all around. And I'm, I agree with uh, Philip Eilander that uh, is very important for this symposium, that those people are willing to address what they have experienced during the past decades and what their vision is uh, for the future. Miriam van Rijsen, she is our driving force behind uh, all the events related to the 100th uh, um, anniversary. It's not an anniversary because uh, Marga Klompé, she was born 100 years ago and uh, she is not uh, in our midst anymore, but her spirit is around, you are very right. So it's a special day uh, for all of us and following the uh, political career of Marga Klompé, in which solidarity and care for others were her guiding light, Marga Klompé devoted herself to church and society. So it was politics, church and society. She was uh, active in the ecumenical, ecumenical efforts, in the emancipation movement and in international organizations for justice and peace. At the end of her life, she wrote her friends a letter with a remarkable concluding sentence, and I quote, facing the approaching end of my life, I express once again my belief that it's God's will that in this confused society, we do everything to bring about justice and peace. That was 1986. Now, no less than then, we live in a confused society. Globalization reveals ever more clearly that mutual interdependence of the world's population. Almost no country, no people is escaping the climate crisis or the financial and economic crisis. The world's innumerable cultures, religions and nationalities are coming face to face with each other more than ever before. We've also seen in the credit crisis how the effect of irresponsible action by some can have disastrous knock-on effects on the welfare of others. Conversely, the good deeds of practical idealists can have a beneficial outcome on many. We are not always aware of this. And as far as I am concerned, that is the meaning of Marga's, Marga Klompé's motto, people can change the world. It was her personal belief, as well as a, a being a call to all of us, to cross borders, literally and metaphorically, with our concern for those who are vulnerable, in a spirit of respect for diversity and with a view to sustainability. Marga Klompé also left us the heritage that we should be especially concerned with young people. We hope that today's symposium on healthy aging will also be focused on the role of young people regarding socially responsible action towards the elderly people. That brings the world further. Thank you very much. Marga Klompé is really very um, alive today and she speaks uh, to many. That is what we have really learned this week, I think. And uh, Agnes, it really is a tribute to you and to the Marga Klompé Foundation that you saw that if the legacy of Marga Klompé was placed again with the new generations of today, that that would actually be very meaningful. So really the credit for uh, what we have achieved this week in um, making this connection from our history to the world of today and into the future um, is really a tribute uh, to your thinking and, and to your um, organizing the chair together with many partners. And many partners have been very crucial to guide us uh, through this uh, week. I would like to welcome very warmly Dick Plessius, 
the uh, director of the Maha Klompe Health Group. I don't know, Dick is there. Dick, you received uh, an international delegation again for the second time this week. We are very grateful uh, for that. It really um, helps us to show that um, working with the legacy of Maha Klompe actually needs to have meaning in life in a practical way. And I think this is what the delegation uh, felt this week, and we are really grateful for your continuing support uh, in that work and also in the work of the endowed chair. Thank you very, very much. Um, René Grotenhuis, I think he is somewhere in the middle. There, René, uh, director of Coordate, together with uh, Johan van Rikstel, have been very supportive uh, in this week, uh, bringing this delegation from uh, Malawi, Zambia, and uh, Zimbabwe, and uh, again, uh, supporting uh, this uh, symposium. Thank you very much, uh, René, and also Johan, who did so much uh, work. Uh, the university itself, the rector, and many, many colleagues have actually really um, made it possible uh, for this week to be um, a translation in so many areas of work that are relevant uh, to the work of the university. Um, you've moved there, Philip, I was looking for you. Um, thank you very, very much for surrounding the, the chair with uh, so much um, uh, collegiality. Uh, and I see many of my colleagues uh, sitting here. Thank you very, very much. I feel very much at home in this university. And it's therefore a pleasure to give the floor to Annelies van Heist, who is uh, really the expert on the subject that we are discussing today, uh, globalization, uh, care, and aging. Annelies, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Miriam. Dear ladies and gentlemen, Maha Klompe had a passion for global justice and human flourishing, as the title of our conference expresses. And she saw to its implementation in politics and legislation. Being a devout Catholic, she had a strong sense of moral obligation towards the most vulnerable members in society. She could, however, not foresee that younger generations would disconnect care rights from care obligations, as is a mainstream public opinion in Dutch society today. How can we deal with that? To begin with, let us identify the most vulnerable and underprivileged people in the field of healthcare. The founding mother of care theory, the American Joan Tronto, pointed out that the social hierarchy of a particular society is revealed in the way in which care work, both paid and unpaid, is distributed. The underprivileged are direct caregivers, professionals who are at the bottom of the labor market. Those who give direct care, who clean the building, who change nappies, who feed the sick, who wash the elderly, are likely to earn the least and receive little appreciation. The ranking works in terms of gender, ethnicity, and migration. Direct care is mostly given by women and people of an ethnic or immigrant background. However, it were these caregivers who taught me a lesson. The lowest in this building 
some caregivers in a nursing home once told me, are the patients, since they cannot speak up for themselves. Mirjam informed me that the European Commission signaled the pro problem of aging and the expected shortage of care provisions and plans to facilitate la labor migration from 2020, uh, 2020 onwards. Migrants of other continents will thus be the future healthcare professionals. So, I believe we should rethink our care arrangements in a globalizing context. Is it a good idea, the plan of the European Commission? Yes, according to some. Miriam van Rijsen writes that it offers an opportunity for cultural exchange, and I think there is truth in it. Others, however, have their reservations. Medical doctor and director of the hospital, Bontan, in Harderwijk, a hospital which established a relationship with a hospital in Ghana, responded that it would be disastrous for Africa because qualified professionals are needed in their own countries. Joke Zwanike, she's sitting there, who for more than 40 years has been a nursing director of a psychiatric hospital in Vught, argued that it would be a disaster for patients because language is the most important thing in nursing care. The one who gives care steps into the intimate sphere of strangers. Two questions came to my mind. How will how will care-depending people feel if nobody of their own social circle is willing to look after them? And what will immigrant care workers experience when they become part of the care drain from west to the south? It is labeled by John Tronto as a new type of imperialism, which robs developing countries of their qualified workers. Is intercontinental migration of healthcare workers the proper answer to the needs of an aging Europe? I believe until 22, we have time for preparation. And I would suggest first that we elaborate on already existing programs of professional support between Western healthcare institutions, like the one in Harderwijk, and those in developing countries. If we label these initi initiatives, which already exist in the Dutch society, as learning communities of change, new insights can be found relating to the dynamics of intercultural care. I believe parties who might join forces here are the healthcare institutions, development organizations like Cordate, and perhaps also our own university. Another source of uh, new insights can be found in Dutch society in projects which bridge the gap between the sector of professional care and the rest of society. For instance, the phenomenon of verwenzorg, tender loving care. Joke Zwanike is the mother of the verwenzorg and companies like De Sligro, A Merchant of Cherries, Restaurant uh, Castel Mauric, theaters, and well-known individuals as Willeke Alberti, a singer, a popular, popular singer, are willing to give their product to chronically ill patients. They do it voluntarily, and all kinds of connections and bonds are established between chronically ill patients and these parties in society. I believe we should learn more about such initiatives. Here you see a picture of the Verwenzorg, the tender loving care. 
If we rethink our care arrangements from a perspective of global justice and love, we first have to acknowledge that the Western healthcare sector is in a profound crisis, which goes beyond a shortage of means and money. There's more to it. Professionals, patients and their relatives are crying out loud for a type of caring which is more than managerial and technocratic. They are crying out loud, they long for a type of caring which combines professional skills with human warmth and empathy. The massive response to my book, Professional Loving Care, proves it. Secondly, we have to recognize the evaporation of family-based care arrangements within the course of two generations. Family-based care arrangements should not be romanticized. It was born out of necessity and placed a considerable burden on the shoulders of the mothers and daughters who acted as main caregivers. There is a parallel with today's care arrangement in development countries. We should not jump to the conclusion that we are witnessing cultural values here since socio-economic necessity underpins these care arrangements. There is something good in it, but care reality is an ambiguous reality. From the 1960s onward, social rights expanded and welfare, care, welfare state emerged. Marga Klompe herself co-established it. Citizens have become used to being in care of the state and as a result of that to new liberties. Today, we are facing the decline of this welfare state, not only because it has become way too expensive, but also it makes citizens act and behave as bearer of rights without being bearers of obligations. In this respect, we need to leave Marga Klompe's legacy behind, looking for a new paradigm of care in a globalizing context. Please share my thoughts on fair care, which I invented for today. It's derived from the idea of fair trade. It's not a fixed program, but an invitation for a dialogue. Fair trade seemed to contradict the dynamics of a market economy. People were willing to pay more for a smaller banana because they feel that the banana is a contribution to a righteous economy in which small far farmers receive their share. Fair care relies on a similar logic. Unlike the banana of fair trade, the extra costs of fair care are not only of a financial nature, which makes it harder to sell. No politician would dare to suggest what I tell you here, since along with fair care come some, com some inconvenient truth. Here are five keys to fair care. The first key is, let us respect caregivers and facilitate care organizations. Respect is a matter of both better payment and immaterial appreciation. Care work, healthcare work deserves a fair salary. Care organizations and institutions need financial facilitations so that they can keep their trained workers instead of having to hire untrained flex workers, which is actually happening today in the Netherlands. Society should develop a way also to the honor the care workers for upholding the standards of civilization. That's exactly what their labor is all about. In France, they had the Ordre de la Sante Publique, de la Santé Publique. You uh, see it on the uh, left side of the picture. A second key to fair trade is, let us revalue re the activities of caregiving and care receiving, 
not as things that you have to do and afterwards you can start living, but as part of life, human life. In Western countries, um, care is viewed as heavy, boring and dirty. What we can learn from our Western past and from intercultural exchange is that care is a mode of life itself. It can be a source of connection, mutuality and joy. Also a joy, a, a source of frustration and anger because that's also part of human life. I could give you a small example. Some nursing homes who used to uh, wash their patients as quickly as they could so that afterwards they could do other activities have changed their policy and now they are taking time to wash the, the patient, give attention, which makes washing part of human life and not something that has to be done so that afterwards human life can start. These are vital changes. Let us redistribute caregiving so that no citizen is excluded. Let us break through the boundaries of gender, class and ethnicity. In Western countries, caregiving and care receiving is done by four social groups, the professionals, the care depending peoples and their relatives and volunteers. A failure of our current care arrangements is that it produces a large group of so-called privileged irresponsibles, people who have nothing to do with care. People who are not in need of care themselves, nor are their relatives. As a result, some groups in society are extremely burdened while others remain free of charge. From the perspective of fair care, this should be criticized as unjust and unfair. Every citizen should contribute to the process of care in one way or another. Perhaps we can remain close to the ideals of justice and love if we think of these extra care activities in terms of a civil virtue, a way of behaving which benefits other people and oneself. The Verwenzorg, the loving care of Joke Zwanike, demonstrates that citizens who get involved in sharing their products, what they can do with care-dependent people, have fun. They do not sacrifice themselves, but enjoy what they are doing. Thus, new types of social cohesion arise. Let us find also the courage to limit health care demands. Also a very unpopular thing. I think we should find that courage. One way would be, would be to make people responsible for unhealthy behavior. Another way would be to restrict medical interventions when people are facing, facing death. Many times medical treatment is offered as a kind of pseudo quasi comfort. This is not a good thing. thing. You're robbing people's, people's scarce time at the end of their lives. There is also an imbalance between cure and care. There are nursing homes in the Netherlands where the residents are only allowed two nappies a day. But what we do not want in, in the Netherlands are limits on medical uh, care, medical treatment. And this is a disproportionate balance which should be criticized as unfair. I come to my last point. The appeal, I think, we should appeal to care-dependent people and their capacity to give and share, and share. They are not only people who need something, they are also people who, have, who can give something. And that's what I learned from um, studying development organization, CORDIT. A misconception of the current care arrangement is that care-dependent people are no longer addressed as people who have something to give. They are reduced to care-needing individuals, which is likely to intensify feelings of isolation and loneliness. There are changes in this field inspired by intercultural dialogue. I think we have a lot to learn from that. To conclude, I argue 
that fair care is care that protects and cherishes the well-being of the most vulnerable and the underprivileged. Here lies the criterion. It's a non-exploitive care, fairly valued, fairly shared. Fair care costs more and brings more. There is added value in it. It enhances global justice and human flourishing in the spirit of Mara Kampé. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Annelies, uh, Professor Van Heist, for a very interesting uh, reflection. Care reality is an ambiguous reality. We saw that this week uh, with the delegation who visited the Maga Klompe Health Group. And um, Annelies, I think that you have just um, given a name for our program, Fair Care. Um, and I hope that in the course of uh, our work in the coming years, we can work with many of the inconvenient truths that you've brought to light. I am now very um, pleased to introduce my co-chair, Wim Meyer. Uh, I think he is known uh, to all of us. He was an, a member of the Dutch parliament from 1971 to 1989. And he was the second next uh, Secretary of State of the Ministry of Culture, Recreation and Social Work. And um, I had the pleasure of learning um, a lot from him of the immediate legacy of uh, Marga Klompe when she had left uh, the ministry. And I thank you for that. Um, we are going back now to uh, the legacy that Marga Klompe uh, has left us as a basis for our discussion today. And first, um, I have a very short introduction of uh, Marga Klompe herself. Er waren bloemen van Dr. Drees voor onze eerste vrouwelijke minister, Dr. Marga Klompe. Ook mevrouw Klompe zullen we weer als minister mogen begroeten. Er is een nieuwe regering. Een minderheidskabinet van alleen KVP'ers en antirevolutionairen. Dat redding zal moeten brengen in een wankele periode van onze economie. En wens ik u toe dat ook de volgende 50 jaar uw bond zijn goede bijdrage zal kunnen leveren in het belang van zijn leden, in het belang van onze gemeenschap. Nu ga ik even het standpunt van de kunstenaar staan die een bepaalde boodschap willen brengen. Een boodschap die niet inhield uh, dat men de democratie omver wil werken. Tegendeel, men, men wil de boodschap brengen voor de vrijheid van het individu en voor de vrijheid van volken. Het enige wat je niet kunt is om ze heen. Want zij brengen verandering. Brengen Nederland verder. Ik vocht ook hard als het nodig was. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Well, uh, I believe after seeing these pictures, we are all at home now. Um, Dr. Marga Compe has had a long and important career in politics, in the church, and in international affairs. And as uh, I said already, her main leading principles were human rights and social equality. This made her an inspiring individual for many of us. Thus, some testimonies will be given about her exceptional qualities. First, former Prime Minister Lubbers will speak, and then Mr. Scheffers on behalf of Justia and Pax. And in addition, I will also gladly say something about her influence on the area of culture and social welfare. Mr. Lippers, the floor is yours. Good 
morning. I have to see my watch. I won't speak too long. Yeah. Marka Klompe was born, as you all know, one century ago. The first 27 years of her life until the Second World War, um, she was a, already a remarkable young person, although quite challenged by the Netherlands of those days and the particular circumstances of her family. Her father was mentally ill, so she had to assist her mother in earning a living. And she was very clever, so she started to study, combined the two things, being a student and earning some living. Then it is 1939, two things happened. This guy was born, 1939. You will understand why I underline this. And Marga had to face the Second World War. It changed her life. Of course, she had to take, make choices, part of the resistance, assisting people, especially at the end of the Second World War in 1944. And after that, she came connected with her generation on the nation scale. So very quickly, she was chosen to represent the Netherlands. New York was the time at the Second World War of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. She took part in that. This is the manga of those days. And then she was inescapable. She went into uh, politics. So there's a lot of stories to tell. First female minister, you saw it already. Shortly after, in 1970, I was asked by Marga Compe to come to The Hague to participate, and our other friends here to tell about that, in Justitia et Pax. It's interesting for me while she started in politics with the motto peace and justice by this institution of the Catholic Church, it became justitia and pax. The whole dimension of peace was of course very important and that was then the motto. I was asked to meet her there. I was still in business constructed bridges, had young children, and was a bit surprised that Minister Klompe invited me to come to The Hague and participate in that work. And I learned a lot of her and of these themes, of course. To take you a little bit further in the Dutch history, in terms of age difference, you could see me as a son of Marga Klompe. 27 years different, as she was the daughter of the first Catholic Prime Minister, Ruis de Beerenbroek. So there are three generations who emancipated the Dutch, the Roman Catholics in Dutch society. And it went on there. Ruis was only history, Marga was really there in the center of everything, and I was the incoming young guy who went into politics, found out there at some point that there were difficult moral questions. So we discussed them. No one on abortion, then we got the euthanasia. Sometimes interesting, I had to discuss this euthanasia with my liberal friends. And they said to me, what are you handicapped? because you, we liberals go for individual choices, and you don't do that. He said, but we have other traditions and qualities, so I started to explain these friends. Sacrament van de stervende. He said, what is that? I said, 
explain that is a long tradition for Roman Catholics that at some point in their life come to an end, the decision is taken that doctors are not longer asked to try the utmost to heal the person again, but to accept you have to die anyhow. So then we invite them to do it different. And that is what we call, we started with a choice together at a person, a family, to go for this sacrament of the dying. And that's a very fundamental point because that we are aware that the ultimate objective, the medical doctor should not be to keep light there always. It's better to make a choice that the moment is, has come to come to an end. Anyhow, this was that. So there we, Roman Catholics, Marga, me, and many others, had to make choices and play a role in how we go further in a modernizing society. Give you a third element. Later, I became High Commissioner for the refugees, and there I learned how important the reproductive health program was for refugees really a contribution, but it's based also on ethical choices. We managed. But anyhow, the Catholic tradition has changed itself, like the whole society has changed. Explain that a little bit. Ms. Marga Compe, you see her there, born in Arnhem, living her living in Nijmegen, this was really a city full of nuns, priests. If you walked around there, and I did that as a young guy, it was, that was the atmosphere. And it was related to a certain extent to the health concept as well. That has changed totally. We are now what we call in a secular society. It's difficult to find these priests and nuns. So it's, this is totally different. But what has changed as well is then the condition in the healthcare. The first speaker, man, thank you very much. I explained that very much in the how do you do this with persons taking care, nursing, playing a role in it. That's one dimension. There's another dimension is, is the fantastic development in the medical science as such and the possibilities. I give you one example of this challenge system. Last Sunday, I was in another meeting together with an Iman. He was from Dutch descent, but had become Muslim. He was often in hospital. There he explained that people today say, how can that medical doctors, when people are in intensive care, take the decision to go on or to end this. They act as they were God. Then I answer to the Iman, you can see it a little bit different. Maybe the intensive care itself is acting as we are God to introduce that system, not to accept anymore. So it came in, that life is coming to an end. So we better talk this over. What are the good things in the intensive care? What are the risky things? And these are new challenges. So the ethical discussion, how to behave, is going on. And I still had hoped that Mara would be here with us, because in that type of discussion, she was excellent. So I just want to draw your attention a little bit to this gift of Mara to go for love, to go for modernizing, and she really was wonderful. And at the same time, the challenges are there for all of us, Catholics and non-Catholics, in a changing world. Let me end with one small known anecdote about Marco Pompe, what was for me a very important one. This was the changing of the Netherlands on many areas, I spoke about the abortion, euthanasia, but there are many more things. I remember from those old days, as the son of Marga, 
to say. And it became that in 1970. Still was a taboo on homosexuality in this country. And she did a marvelous thing because at an occasion when she was a minister, she received a kiss of a famous homo writer and she returned that in such a warm and open way that the whole country was surprised. What's happening here? And with that she put the mark what it means to be generous to others and to appreciate different people. So this is another example of her. I could go on for a long time. I won't do that. I just want to bring to you the tradition of Marga and the ongoing challenge that you explained so well. How do you cope with modernity? And how do you do it these days? I think this is the main fee here today. Thank you so much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. During her lifetime, Maga Klompe was always involved in the struggle for a just cause. She could not tolerate injustice. She was really concerned about the fate of marginalized and oppressed people. She considered it as a Christian duty to stand up for those people. She did it as a member of parliament and as a minister, and she continued after her departure from politics in 1971 in Justitia et Pax and numerous Catholic and ecumenical institutions and initiatives. It has been said before by Mr. Lubbers in 1947, she became uh, a member, before she became a member of parliament, Marka Klompe was sent to New York as a member of the Dutch delegation to the General Assembly of the United Nations. Thus, she became involved in the creation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. This Universal Declaration, she wanted to make a reality for everyone, regardless of race, sex, religion, and nationality. I would like to highlight some basic values that characterized life and work of Marga Klompe, and hopefully they can serve as building blocks for an ethical approach to healthcare and aging in a globalized world, and as a source of inspiration for our work. Last Friday, we celebrated the 85th Dies Natalis of Tilburg University. 10 years ago, the 75th anniversary of this university provided an opportunity to organize a workshop on globalization and human dignity. One of the most neglected aspects of globalization is its ethical dimension. What could be the role of moral and religious values and norms? In his introduction, Bishop Martinez Muskens of Breda Diocese referred to the long tradition that goes back to one of the founders of this university, Professor Kobenhagen, who was a priest from Roermond Diocese in the southern part of the Netherlands. He was a fierce opponent of the so-called neutral approach of sciences. According to Kobenhagen, the practice of science, which in his case meant economics, should serve the realization of human values like justice and liberty ensuring that people can reach their full potential. Everyone who worked with Marga Klompe has experienced that she lived and worked from a deep-rooted Roman Catholic faith, always focused on the other, our fellow men, regardless of religion, development, race, sexual orientation or nationality. In the other, she saw her neighbor. She was interested in the other person, always willing to care, to give help and advice. 
Her life and work were imbued with the biblical command, you must love your neighbor as yourself. This view of the duty of every woman and man in the world can be connected to some of the key values of Catholic social teaching, human dignity, love and justice, the common good, solidarity, and political participation. The Catholic Church defends the unalienable dignity of each and every human being. Human dignity is the grounding source for every system of ethics. Made in the image of God, women and men have a preeminent place in the social order. Human dignity can be recognized and protected only in a community with others. From this perspective, the fundamental question to ask about human development is, what is happening to people? Love of the neighbor is an absolute demand for justice because love and charity must manifest itself in actions and structures which respect human dignity, protect human rights, and facilitate human development. To promote justice is to transform structures which block love. The common good is the sum total of all those conditions of social life, economic, political, cultural, which make it possible for women and men readily and fully to achieve their perfection in humanity. Individual rights are always experienced within the context of the promotion of this common good. Human dignity calls for solidarity among people. We belong to one human family. And as such, we have mutual obligations to promote the rights and development of all people across communities, nations, and the world. Thus, human dignity requires a solidarity which goes beyond immediate relationships. We must make sure that all can share in the fruits of the earth. Every person has a right to access those means that are needed to reach his or her full pot human potential. And finally, democratic participation in decision-making is the best way to respect the dignity and liberty of people. The government is the instrument by which people cooperate together in order to achieve the common good. For Marga Klompe, these were not empty words. She was convinced that the gifts she had received from God had to be used to serve all members of society. She considered herself an instrument of God. Her social activities were intimately connected with her prayer life. For Marga Klompe, there was no split between the faith she, prof she professed and her daily life. The evangelical perspective of the kingdom of God and the values of Catholic social teaching have been the identification of all social, political, and religious activities of Marga Klompe. In that context, the vision Matthew wrote down in the 21st, 25th chapter of his gospel has been guidance in her life and work. The son of humanity in all his glory and surrounded by all angels says that we should not rise up to him, but that he can be found where people are relating to each other, where they dress, care, or console each other, where they keep each other company. I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. In an interview with the Catholic newspaper, The Tate, in 1977, Marga said, Christ is the source of inspiration for me in standing up for the oppressed and outcast in society. That's not so difficult for me. I love people. For Marga Klompe, faith was always political. It focused on the service of people, on justice and a human society for all. From her religious inspiration, she opposed poverty, exploitation, oppression, human rights abuses, and all forms of exclusion, discrimination, and racism. From 1971, Marga Klompe made that deep faith motivation of her political action available to the churches, in particular to the Catholic Church and the ecumenical movement. And it was in the, this last period of her life that I came to know her and worked with her in the Dutch Commission Justitia et Pax. 
Justitia et Pax is the global organization of the Catholic Church for Justice and Peace. It was founded in 1967 to make Catholics more aware of their responsibility to contribute to the realization of justice and peace in the world. Maga Klompe was involved from the outset, first by her membership of the Polit Pontifical Commission Justitia et Pax and later from 1972, 13 years as president of the Dutch Commission. People can change the world. That is what Maga Klompe taught me. In her last interview, shortly before she died, she said, in my experience, people can change the world positively or negatively. Sometimes individuals bring about the change, such as in the case of Sid Francis or Martin Luther King, but they are saints. In the great majority of cases, you cannot do it alone, but you need others. And if people together want to make the world a better place, driven by one inspiration, they can get pretty far. It is, however, always a long-term process. I have experienced working with her as a great privilege. She knew how to connect her genuine, genuine anger about violations of human dignity and human rights to a both clever and tough dedication to end them. That was the leitmotif through all her political, social, and church-related activities. The life of Marca Klompe is an authentic story of a woman who spoke straight from her heart, who made no secret of what inspired her. In her political career and in her numerous civic and church activities, she showed how you can work very specifically on improving the position of disadvantaged people. She worked with determination to solve the problems of people. With her strong faith in a humane society, with her deep and genuine Christian motivation to make the world a little better and more livable, she has achieved much. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, um, Dr. Marga Kompe was an overwhelming and dominant personality. She had a great social engagement, an enormous know-how, broad interest, and a large sense of responsibility. She was serious, hardworking, and demanding but with empathy. The first female minister of the Netherlands and one of the founders of the social welfare state. Deeply rooted in Catholicism, but also critical towards some de de developments in the church. These are the descriptions that come from the biography by Gerard Mostert which was published last year about Marga Compe. This voluminous and important work gives the reader an insight in the life and work of this very special woman. It's therefore right that Tilburg University devotes this special symposium to her legacy, and it's therefore an honor and a privilege to speak here today. I've met Marga Compe several times. And the first time was in her home, the Smitswater in The Hague. It was in May 1973, and I had just been inaugurated as Secretary of Culture, Recreation and Social Work, the ministry to which Marga Compe had said goodbye two years earlier. Minister Harry van Doorn and I heard in one evening everything that was important to know for our new area of work. What the department was about, its strong and weak points, how policy areas were developing. She left a deep impression on me that evening. What I also saw is what bound Marga Compe and me 
At that moment, she was 60 years of age, and I just 34. She was a prominent member of the Catholic Party, and I was a social democrat. But in many ways, we were thinking in the same way. The political ideas of Marco Compré were fitting extremely well with a worldview which was also the basis of my own political thought. This thinking roots in the first decennium of the 20th century, a remarkable time in which the enlightened upper class took responsibility for emancipation among broad layers of the population in order to improve their material well-being in the form of laws in the area of social security, health, and the development of social housing. But also, but certainly also to improve their mental well-being in the form of community centers, public university, libraries, and societies for leisure and nature conservation. The fundamental vision at that time was give every citizen a chance to develop his or her potential and ensure social cohesion and the social structure of society that binds citizens. Ladies and gentlemen, Marga Compe is rooted in this tradition. She grew up in a devout Roman Catholic family which benefited from the successful emancipation of the Catholic members of society. This made of Compe a person who would forever advocate in favor of the emancipation of oppressed groups in society, women, workers, and later people who were not born in the Netherlands. And she saw it as a task of the state to promote emancipation, to improve and finance the material and immaterial circumstances. But the family in which she grew up also taught her what it is to take responsibility for others. When her father became ill and had to close his factory, the family quickly fell in poverty. But despite the difficult financial situation, Marga was allowed to study the only, the only one of the five children. And she took her responsibility. She remained at home and worked as a teacher alongside her study to earn money to help the family income. Those experiences in her youth shaped her political thinking. The Ministry of Social Work was founded in 1952 and Marga Compe was only its second minister. It related seamlessly well to her political thinking. The ministry is the institutionalizing of the idea that citizens have responsibility for those close to him, but that the state in turn has responsibility for the well-being of all the citizens, for their material and immaterial well-being. And the ministry bridges the contradictions between the red and the Roman vision on the welfare state. The social democrats at that time put their emphasis on the social security and the role of the state in it. The Catholics put emphasis on the importance of the immaterial well-being in the role of the church and private initiative. The new ministry, and certainly Minister Crompe, shaped the compromise. This is expressly true for the law on universal social protection, in Dutch, the Algemene Bijstandswet, which was prepared under her leadership. This was a law, and I quote Clompe, on which every citizen could call with head high 
and where he or she would not be put in an atmosphere that would challenge his freedom of respect as a person. Support as an unforeseeable, a right organized by the state, not a charity. Care for mat material well-being, therefore, but implemented through a ministry that also guarantees care for the immaterial well-being, social work. Crompe would have liked to unite these two aspects in one law, to place it in one building, as you would say it, but that ap appeared to be too ambitious. The law was in and, in and of itself already complex, and its adoption was a crown on the work of Crompe. The universal law on social protection was the final piece of the post-war institutionalization of social security. Michael Comple is therefore one of the founders of our social security state. And yet Comple is for people of my generation a person who stands, who stands out for an other reason. In 1967, she was, after a period as parliamentarian, again a minister. This time of the ministry that was expanded with culture and recreation. Precisely because of the value she attached to the non-material, she was perfectly at home in the area of culture. That's why this lady in a shoot had such a remarkable understanding for the resistance of the provost, the demonstrating students and artists who were criticizing the so-called consumption society. In one of her speeches, she described this in a, one, in, in a, in a beautiful sentence, and I quote, not possession, but playing makes us free. Artists contribute, in her view, to the creation of new values and norms, even if the work by some is considered repulsive. And uh, Prudlubus uh, told us already, she received in August 69 a spontaneous kiss on the check by a young author at that time, Cornelis Gerard van der Dreven, an image of Marga Compe that people of our generation never will forget. And so we come to what in my view is the determinant of the value of Marga Compe for our time. And I believe her value is big. Not possessions, but playing makes us free. Is this thinking still present when we talk about intrinsic value of art and the freedom of the artist? And do we hear ideas about society in which the immaterial aspects have at least equal meaning as the material ones? Such ideas about connecting people, taking responsibility for each other? It's those ideas that determine the political life of Marga Compe. And these values are very much needed in this restless country of today. Ladies and gentlemen, I see comparisons between the time in which we live today and the period to which I referred at the beginning of my contribution. The period of the first decennium of the 20th century. Then, a century ago, there was an enlightened class which saw that the enormous gap between the illiterate, the poor, the undefeated, and the culturally active, better situated, could harm our country. This situation does not fit in the image of progress. And therefore, at that special moment, they decided to take responsibility for the emancipation of those 
we were less well off than they were. And they brought a connection, a bond, where before had been a deep gap. And it would be good if this could happen again. Of course, the gap of the 21st century is a different one. Today we see well-educated cosmopolites, which are totally at home in this complex world, and we see the lower educated who feel they are missing the boat entirely. And both of them think, what do I care about society? The, cos the cosmopolites think, I look after myself. The lower educated quit and don't longer participate. And this is the beginning of fragmentation in a society instead of cohesion. I see it therefore as an urgency that we create a new form of connection coming up in our society, in the education to adults, in the access to the labor market, in the living environment. Let us take up our responsibility in all those areas. For the same reason as a century ago, Without the principles of a connected society, our country will suffer and we will limit progress. This is the lesson that the Netherlands of a century ago teaches us today. And this is what connects up to the legacy of Marga Compe. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Wim, uh, for the beautiful uh, speech. The speech has been uh, printed in the book that is uh, available outside the diary of Marga Krompe uh, in uh, Love and Justice because Wim had provided it uh, earlier and we thought it was very fitting. In uh, Love and Justice, the diary is called, you refer to it, uh, Mr. Lubbers um, and Victor. Uh, made the link uh, that Marga also expresses in the diary so clearly how in being, in acting in love and justice, she seeks to be an instrument of God. Um, and I love the way in which you described her desire to transform structures that block love. That's a very beautiful way of, uh, of expressing her legacy. What we have been trying to do in this year is to bring this legacy and going back to the source, her source, through the diary, but also by benefiting from your memory of her and look at that for the relevance in today's society. And um, Wim, I think your diagnosis is very much spot on and thank you very much for that. The trailer that we saw at the beginning of uh, this uh, session has been provided to us by Combeat. I don't know if they are already here. They're coming this uh, afternoon. Combeat is Come Beat Poverty. And it is a group of very young people, a very multicultural group that is based in Amsterdam. And um, they uh, interviewed me about Marga Klompe. And then a week later, they sent me that trailer because they were so inspired and they asked to be here. They are here this afternoon in one of the workshops. Um, I am now going to show a very short uh, trailer with apologies to those who also attended the DS because I wanted to make the connection with culture. And we are now uh, very fortunate to have at this university a statue of Marga Klompe, which really is a celebration of her life and of her importance. Uh, we will later today go to the Dante building where you will be able to see the statue. But um, the artist who provided, the, who made the um, statue, 
um, has really been able to express very well what she found when she went into the meaning of Marga Klompe's life and how she would express that in the statue. And that is why I would like to uh, show the trailer now. Thank you. Marga Klompe is vooral bekend geworden als de eerste vrouwelijke Nederlandse minister. Zij werd minister in 1956. In 1948 kwam zij in de Tweede Kamer. Daarvoor, tijdens de Tweede Wereldoorlog, gaf zij leiding aan het verzet in Nederland. Als minister um, heeft zij de universele wet op de sociale zekerheid gerealiseerd, of de wet op de universele sociale zekerheid gerealiseerd, de wet op de bejaardenorde. Dus zij is heel belangrijk geweest om de sociale fundering te creëren waarop ook vandaag nog de Nederlandse samenleving is gebouwd. Het is natuurlijk heel moeilijk om precies te beschrijven wat ze voor persoonlijkheid is. Ik kan alleen uh, uh, proberen te beschrijven zoals als ik haar zeg maar, opgepakt heb. En dat is vanuit iemand die vanuit een, uh, een, een hele humane visie in die politiek zat. En vanuit die hele uh, sterke, ook vanuit haar een, een soort natuurlijke autoriteit als vrouw zijnde. Toch in die enorme bollen, mannenbolwerk wat het toen was, dat ze automatisch toch daar haar plek vond. En, en mensen naar haar luisterden gewoon, omdat ze die enorme betrokkenheid vanuit binnen, vanuit haar ziel had. Het is heel eervol om met haar gedachtegoed te kunnen werken op deze universiteit um, aan het relevant maken van het onderzoek wat wij hier doen voor de samenleving. Ik vind het ook heel erg leuk. Ik merk dat doordat de leerstoel is gekoppeld aan iemand die zo'n duidelijk gezicht heeft, die zo'n uitgesproken mening had en die heel inspirerend was, dat dat ook heel inspirerend werkt voor de studenten en dat de studenten het ook leuk vinden om die aanknopingspunten te ontdekken die Marga Klompé geeft. En um, natuurlijk is het bijzonder eervol dat deze dias vandaag op deze manier rondom Marga Klompé georganiseerd wordt. Maar dat is een eerbetoon natuurlijk aan Marga Klompé en uh, het belang van haar werk voor de Nederlandse samenleving. En ik ben blij en trots dat ik daar een bijdrage aan mag geven. Ik heb geprobeerd niet één leeftijdsfase weer te geven, maar eigenlijk ze door elkaar te vlechten. En daardoor hoop ik dat het wat, ook wat leeftijdsloos wordt. Dat heb ik geprobeerd. Maar natuurlijk van, ah, wat, wat, wat het belangrijkste is, is dat ook de, de geprobeerd hebben om een enorme dynamiek weer te geven. Vandaar dat het ook het beeld scheef op de, kijk, zo is de voorkant. Ze zit scheef op de sokkel en ze, ze maakt echt een gebaar om... Degene die ze toespreekt uh, te betrekken bij wat ze zegt en van een, uit een innerlijke passie dat uh, uh, wil uh, overreden. Dus ook die hele dynamiek die vanuit uh, uit haar leven eigenlijk spreekt en niet bepaald uh, de, de begane paarden loopt, is dat ze dus, ik heb haar scheef weergegeven, zie je dus met één schouder naar voren. Waarin ze een gebaar maakt van overtuiging, die hand, die steekt ze naar voren om, degene, uh, om te overtuigen, omdat ze overtuigd is van wat ze wil zeggen. En uh, um, ja, met, vanuit een innerlijke bewogenheid eigenlijk uh, in, die, in, ja, in die politiek zit. Vandaag tijdens het diest staat het leiderschap van vrouwen wereldwijd centraal uh, en dat is... Um, in relatie tot het gedachtegoed van Klompé, zowel met een hele internationale dimensie. Daarom dat we ook zo trots zijn en blij dat president Ellen Johnson Sirleaf hier is. 
en met de aanwezigheid van de koningin vanochtend die het beeld heeft onthuld van Marga Klompé. En dat heeft een hele bijzondere uh, betekenis. Uh, omdat het koningshuis, uh, koningin Juliana en koningin Beatrix, Marga Klompé heel goed hebben gekend. En het is daarom heel natuurlijk, maar ook heel eervol, dat de koningin vandaag dit eerbetoon aan Marga Klompé heeft uh, willen betuigen. to present to you Minister Sakai Holland from Zimbabwe, Minister of National Reconciliation and Healing and Integration, who, steps in the, who stands in the footsteps of Marga Klompe. Minister Holland, you received on the 7th of November the Peace Prize of Sydney, which is a very prestigious prize, and also there in her acceptance speech She referred to the legacy of Marga Klompe. She has also been here this week to be present in the uh, visit to the Marga Klompe Health Group to look at the issues of care and aging in Zimbabwe. Minister, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much. We don't have much time, so I have comprehensed something of 30 minutes to 15. So I will start by saying distinguished guests, all protocol observed. <laughs> That's the Zimbabwe way. Um, I really wanted now to just do five points so that we have some sense in what we have to say. And um, the first point would be something I have just devised now, which makes a very good connection with Marga Klompe here. In 1985, the United Nations Women's Summit, where was this particular one was held in Nairobi, and the NGO, um, Uh, slogan was equality, peace, and development. And the Africans, the African women, came to ask naively, because we didn't know this thing had taken all this time to prepare for and could not be changed. We said, but we would like to add the word justice to equality, peace, and development, because you can't get peace without justice. We spent three days arguing, and we failed, but It is really heartening to come to the Netherlands uh, three years ago, it is now, and find that there was a woman much, much earlier than 1985 who really believed in peace with justice. So I wanted to start by saying that in Zimbabwe, after a lot of real struggle and strife among ourselves, we also have realized that without peace in our country, we cannot move forward at all. And that the care of anybody, children, the elderly, jobs, education, health, will be very badly affected as they have been for a long time. So we've gone through a process where we are sitting down as the three political parties to come up with frameworks by discussion, by debate, by agreement, by consensus, consensus building, and then moving on. And we have simultaneous processes in a transitional given time, 
during the global political agreement when the framework is to lead to free and fair elections where the result is not contested by anybody, where the uh, transition is smooth. Nobody will be setting up militias to beat anybody else to say we won when the results clearly show who won. So the global political agreement is also based on uh, that the parties are going to eventually finish the whole process uh, with the guarantee of SADC and of the African Union and ultimately the United Nations. And this for me again is very interesting that Maga Klombe is there at the establishment of this peace institution, the United Nations. Um, I wanted to say that in our country, the traditional mo model of caring is really ingrained within the family system. And I wanted to say to the previous speaker, um, one real challenge between Africa and the West is that the dialogue that takes place is not ever within a context where there is a recognition that we are talking about societies with different world views fundamentally. The African worldview is a secular one where life never ends. You are born, you are, in the first month, you reflect the faces of your maternal, or, uh, uh, paternal ancestors because they are there right at your point of birth. And after the first three months, you come up as who you are going to be depending on who says what there. Then that circle ends up with the elders who are now um, unisex or coco and they become ancestors as death and they continue the cycle. It just is there. And absolutely in my generation, there is no way that you can convince me that the ancestors are not there because they are there and they really do conduct our lives for us is a belief. And there's no clash with Christianity at all because Christianity also has in a different way its saints, it's the different things like that, which we are able to actually digest and actually move on with. So the care of people is closely integrated within the family, but the family, because we are exogamous, is very inclusive. In a society which is settled, there is no one who is excluded. It is really inclusive in terms of that the marriage patterns being exogamous, clearly defined responsibilities, duties, obligations, at birth, at death, at marriage, everything is really very clearly defined and clearly understood. And death does not ever bring vacuums, ever, because within the family structure, you know exactly who steps in what shoe to do what, according to the cohorts and cohort um, arrangements that are there. And death is just seen as change and regeneration because a new cohort comes in. So uh, when you yourself become a parent, you know you're going to be a grandparent, you know you're going to be eventually an elder, and you know you're going to be unisex as ukoko. Unless we enter these dialogues between Africa and the West, where we have had long relations, where these things should now be automatically clear. I think we are always going to miss the opportunities, which are really staring in our faces, of how we can move agendas forward. Um, one thing which I can never ever um, get understood by colleagues in the West is that even as we have entered this room, Africans realize when we leave this room, we are going to be totally changed. And it doesn't matter where we go, because of the interactions that we actually face. But I think in this society, because people are really um, focused on analysis, on the word, on the present, on consumerism, they miss so many things. And so I hope this uh, meeting really does open our eyes to each other, because we have the same failings in relation to yourselves, I'm sure. So the African family was not static. It always was traveling, it was mobile. And when we travel around Africa, you do find very much that these networks have left DNA footprints. Um, 
And with the Zambians here and the Malawians, <laughs> you are looking at some of the footprints which may have left by some of my maternal relatives. And we are very curious to know what happened. Um, the care of the old within African communities is firmly within your ambit as the family. And it's not something that's about to change. Because if you cannot look after your elderly for any reason, through discussion, through agreement within the family, within the extended family, within the community, some definite arrangement has to be made. And the caregivers that work in rural areas who are here with us are able to actually explain how this definitely happens on the ground. Things are very clearly defined, even where there is this chaos. People really know, when I get up tomorrow morning, where am I going to be going and what am I going to do? I think we need to really capture this and work on it. We have seen the change today with the colonial process. And um, the Western people built their own homes for older persons in three schemes. These are Dr. Stamps, who is here with us, the longest uh, serving Minister of Health in Zimbabwe. Uh, we've brought him here as a, a, a resource person because he can explain more clearly A, B, C, and A, B, and C schemes. These schemes, again, unfortunately, because this short-sightedness is a disease, um, some of these homes are being, the white homes, are being closed and sold off, and they are now supermarkets. Because people who are in power right now, the Africans, cannot understand that our children are now overseas, the middle class. And these homes are ones where we could actually improve and change, because that's where we are going. No one is going to be looking after us. And so one of the interests that I have in being here is to really understand truly how we are able to save the further closure of these homes. Because in the political crisis, the pensions were wiped out. So these people who are supposed to pay the workers, they found that they can't. And there's no scheme at the government level to actually help them to sustain themselves. Hence the closure and sale, meaning that you have more destitute people now. Now, the children in the diaspora in Zim from Zimbabwe are mainly doing care work, and it's very unorganized. Um, you have, for example, I'll use Australia, because that's what I'm more, uh, for the West, for Europe, uh, and pinning in with what we have seen here. Nurses from Zimbabwe, and I want to answer the thing about language and about culture. When the idea of nurses to go to Australia was first noted, the Australians, remember, they've come from a white Australia policy. Two wongs don't make them white. Uh, they've come from very bad racism, but opened up and found it pleasurable. And so the nurses who are the most popular in, in Australia, in Australian hospitals, patients will say, can you give me a Zimbabwean nurse? It is Zimbabwean nurses because of their expertise. And again, I believe the cultural dimension of caring and the word which is very missing in our world today, loving, because they have this, it's uh, uh, the feeling that the old people have done their work, whether they know that person or not, and they deserve better, which is how we approach the old. Um, you have a second category of carers who in Zimbabwe are highly trained, and we have here Shorai uh, Chitongo, who I hope people really do talk to, People without the formal training, formal, but through grasswork training, self-training, have organized themselves into organizations. Fortunately, she's here with um, the mother body, which is based in New York, and starts from 1995 in Wauro, where we were uh, with the Beijing conference. They are here together, and they've managed to organize 300,000 care workers in different parts of the world. This is a huge resource of people with an understanding of having taken out of the private sphere into the public a, a skill that women in our country have, and girls, and uh, where they are now using this voluntarily. And I think policymakers need to look at this resource more closely and see how this can be mainstreamed and really become part of what is beneficiary, both in Zimbabwe and here. What is the way forward? Ah, oh, hang on, hang on. There's another category where nurses are, or care workers are recruited, 
by uh, private organizations, they are pay when they are in Australia. They get, I mean, the salaries are quite incredible of what people get in Zimbabwe and what people get abroad, anywhere where they go. So if their money, they get half, which is a lot for somebody who is uh, earning $100 a month at home as a professional. Um, the other half is sent home. Part of it goes to the family for their own use. The other half goes to uh, like build a house or uh, get a pension or for the nurse who is working. And this scheme has been uh, for 15 years. I hope this is more looked closely and people are able to really see what to do with it. What is the way forward? The first thing is there has to be a policy shift here in the Netherlands, Europe, America, in Africa, towards understanding that the policy frameworks that we do because like there is a austerity measures to be done, there is a lot we are able to actually discuss to see how these cuts can be done where they are not so harmful in terms of uh, shifts of how we do work for ourselves in the future. Because the issue of the elderly has very little to do with them because we are going there ourselves. This seems to be totally missed by everybody in Zimbabwe. I can never understand when people are saying them, 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 because we are going there. And I've actually invented a phrase to say uh, we are in the departure lounge, most of us. Um, now, I think that uh, uh, in Western countries, um, there has been a relationship developed where there are these um, aid packages. I think really through talking with one another, we can really understand that what we are calling democratization in Africa, like in Zimbabwe right now, which is the building of inclusive societies where we really do conduct our business with good governance, not in the Western way which is looked down upon by a lot of politicians, but in the true sense of that governance is something that in Zimbabwe, successive governments have failed to understand. Like if you go back, which we don't do in Zimbabwe, we deal with the present, if you really go back to successive governments, they have done some brilliant things. Even Smith, he did some brilliant things. Edgar Whitehead, Garfield Todd, they all did brilliant things, but none of them got the governance right, including the present government. The governance is not right because there's a coercive machinery of violence that is used to actually deal with governance, which is shutting people up. Um, so these things have to be got right. And uh, we need to be talking to one another that there is no threat to democratizing a society. Instead, it's really an inclusive society is beneficiary to everybody. So I would say in ending my, um, well, this thing, there are four areas where we can actually open up to start talking. The first one would be at government to government level. We've got our ambassador here and I'm really, really glad she took the time to come because there are immediate things that can be done country to country, policy uh, to policy discussions. And our ambassador here is able to really talk to people and uh, explain how that can be done in terms of any of the alternatives that are here. Number two, you actually can um, have exchange visits. This is my second visit here. Very enjoyable. I was going to book into one of the homes. I'll be 70 next month. I was going to book into one of the homes to bring my husband who refuses to age and just book ourselves there for a year <laughs> to finish my degree. And uh, um, I don't think that will be possible because <laughs> Miriam wants me to finish my PhD with her. Um, the, <laughs> the, the, the real thing about the homes we saw each one that I saw is better than the other. I was thinking that why would anyone want to be on their own here? I have so many grandchildren. I was thinking now James could fit on his bed there. Sienna, there, this is my grandchildren. It would be so nice to just check in there with my grandchildren in one room because we are able to use that space very well. No need for a carer either. The kids do it to learn how to care. Um, <laughs> There is a second thing, uh, so the, the ambassador, the exchange visits, I really hope Marion, uh, Dr. Um, Van Riesen, we are really able uh, to get 
um, the Maga Klompe people that we have met here who've been so wonderful, and the Kode who say they're closing down their aid, God forbid. Um, I was thinking of ways in which how we could actually work something out so they continue, not even just funding, but getting their expertise back to Africa because by them not putting money back there doesn't mean that we cannot continue to use the wisdom, the skills, the data that they have gathered in the time that they've been working with us. So those relationships have to continue to be kept. Um, I hope these exchange visits take place to Zambia, to Malawi, to Zimbabwe, and that we are able to actually host the people there, and I'm sure they'll want to check into one of the homes there as well. Then we can have real fair exchange. There is also another area. I don't know how this can be done. Uh, I know I'm here in a neutral sphere, but I cannot be t uh, but be tempted to say, in Zimbabwe, the foundations from Europe, from different countries, have done fantastic work with party-to-party -party work. And one of the sewers, I know people say they don't want to go into politics because politics is a dirty game. That's precisely what attracted me to go in, because we need to clean it up. Until we actually work with these foundations as women, the sewer will always get worse because the men will have their deal, they think they've got the truth, move on. And the women are still scuttling behind the, in the women's wings and the youth wings. So we need to actually have party-to-party -party exchanges with the women's wings, I don't know why they're called wings, and the youth wings being actually at the table to say these are the programs we want. I come from a social democratic party, so this is an ad for the democratic parties there, that indeed we need to get these things going. Um, we signed an agreement with Mrs. Mary Robinson. Um, incidentally, if the reason we have here Dr. Stamps, Dr. Stamps and I are both in the office of the president and cabinet. And if you want to upset the president of the republic, is to deny Mary Robinson's program, Dr. Miriam Van Riesen's program, uh, access and moving on. Because they are there working with us, the Ministry for Women, the Organ for National Healing, and now the Health Advisory Office. So if you really want to be in good books with our president, you have to know that when we say Mary Robinson or Mar Van Riesen's program, it's really, let it go on. So you can actually do quite a lot with this new uh, window with a uh, doctor stamps, because here we want to do intergenerational continuity to actually get to understand what really happened under Zan, what happened under Smith, why have we got this situation, how can we move on? And I was talking about the parties, a party agreement among the women's wings was signed. It is still sitting there. And with our consultant, Rulo Chitiga, we can actually take that up and move on with this care thing. And I think you will find that it will fly. So the party-to-party -party exchanges, the liberal Democrats, the social Democrats, the whatever, they are there, their parties there are actually there. So what is the conclusion? Uh, the conclusion here is that Europe and Africa have a lot that they can actually uh, open up to talk historically, because a lot of the challenges we have today are challenges which were established at the colonial process, which have not been resolved. We can really nicely resolve those if we both put down the guilt and say we want to see how this can be redone for us, for our children. Um, I think the key which the women in Zimbabwe are trying to grapple with, how do we take the skills, the knowledge, the professional treatment we do to our husbands, you know, massaging their egos at the period of our own, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the children are pampered. It's, how do we take those things onto the public view? So we remove the negative and take the positive. Because really, in fighting for justice, for equality, for peace, if we do not analyze those things properly, we can actually throw away the baby with the water. Anyway, it was a 30-minute thing, but I have had to cut it down to just these 15 minutes. Thanks.
It is an honor to have you here, Honorable Minister, together with Dr. Stamps. I think also during the um, visits this week, um, the delegation has been very lively, not only because all the issues that were discussed were so pertinent, but also because it is symbolic and historic that you have both joined in this visit from two different parties that have gone through very difficult times and we really wish you well for the future and hope to contribute to it also. Thank you. I also want to mention two other things. One thing that you left out, which is actually very important if we talk about um, aging and cooperation between Africa and Europe is that we age very differently. I'm not going to give a speech here now, but I just want to mention that at the age that you have as a grandmother, you are looking after 30 orphans in your relatively small house. And I really commend you for that. And it is just a tribute to what aging means in different parts of the world. No, this is true, and that is why I wanted to mention it, because you are doing it, but you are not the only one in this hall, never mind in the world, who is doing that. And there are some of my friends there in the back who I know are doing exactly the same thing. I also want to recognize that the Embassy of the Netherlands in Harare is organizing a conference in honor of Maga Klompe in Harare to help and assist the process of peace in Zimbabwe and the importance of women's leadership in that process. That conference will take place on the 29th and 30th of November and I'll be traveling there with uh, Kathleen Ferrier. We'll both be speaking there. Thank you. I know, uh, I know that uh, we are running a little bit uh, over time and sorry for um, cutting you a little bit uh, short, Honorable Minister, but I think, and, and we agreed uh, as co-chairs that we would not take it out. We wanted to um, give you a little break with um, the film that explains and shows these really very beautiful creations there, and I need to explain them so that uh, it, uh, it explains the movie that you will see. Um, one of our colleagues, uh, uh, Lisbeth Hoeve, in the valorization program uh, with Erik Borgman, Erik is there, and I had the idea. She said, well, if we want to bring Marga Klompe back to the students, we need to make them uh, recreate what the legacy of Marga Klompe is so that they can literally embody it. And this is what you see at the Diaz. They showed it themselves. They showed their own creations that they were uh, wearing. And I, will, I cannot, the time does not allow me to go in too much detail, but it was really very enlightening for us. So they choose how they wanted to represent the legacy of Marga Klompe but quite a few of the, those creations are about the spiritual faith of Marga Klompe, also her spiritual crisis and how, we, um, and how she came through that in uh, a, a sense of uh, a ecumenical sense and a sense of uh, a respect for uh, religion and culture in different uh, places in the world. Other, uh, aspects relate to her leadership, other, other aspects relate to her concern about the future, her concern about uh, society. 
And I just uh, would uh, uh, ask now that the film is shown. Shown. I hope you uh, enjoy it, you relax. It also has some images of the uh, Diaz, so that those who were not there can see a little bit of that important moment when we gave the honorary doctorate to President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. Thank you. of the celebration of the 85th Dies Natalis of Tilburg University. Today we are celebrating our 17th lustrum and it's indeed a very special day for Tilburg University. Just a few hours ago, Our Majesty Queen Beatrix visited our campus. She revealed the statue of Marga Klompe in our Dante building. This was a fitting tribute to the 100th anniversary of the birth of Marga Klompe, the first female minister of the Netherlands. Imagine there's no countries It isn't hard to do Nothing to kill or die for And no religion to Excellencies, on behalf of all the students of the ROC Fashion Department, I wish you all a very warm welcome at our fashion show in honor of Marga Klompe. Let me tell you first a bit about how it all started. Well, our teacher asked us to participate in a project with the university and told us that we had to design for Marga Klompe. Uh, I'm sorry, Marga who? was the first question that popped in almost everybody's mind. After a bit of research on Google, we were very surprised. Yes, a strong woman with an amazing resume. There's no doubt about that. But we didn't see the link with fashion right away. <laughs> but then our art teacher came up with a different take on the whole project. What if, if we design in thought of Marga Klompe? Marga had an incredible vision and desire for unity and harmony. So what would Marga think about current social is, uh, issues in today's society? That became the main question that we had to ask ourselves during the design process. Now, you can understand that every single student had his own answer to that certain question. That resulted in some very interesting concepts. Concepts like taking a break of today's fast-moving society, equal rights between women and men, respect, racism, overconsumption, cloning and eco-fashion. Later on in the design process, the African fabrics by Flisco were added. For the fact that this would increase the multicultural aspects of the collection and for our international guests. And also Marga did a lot of good work for international relations. So at first there were a lot of doubts coming from the students as each of them designed their piece in their own fabric and had their own ideas. So they asked themselves if the African fabric would not affect their original concepts and designs. But it actually worked out quite well and the collection became a whole collection. One student even said that they weren't single pieces anymore, but it became a complete collection. Moreover, it was an honor to design for Marga Compe and in her thoughts. But now it's time to let you see it all for yourself. <laughs> and I will stop rambling. <laughs>
So I will now leave you to it and I will say nothing more than be amazed and enjoy the show. Thank you. <laughs> Madam President, Excellencies, distinguished guests, our dream has the size of freedom are the poetic lines with which you gave inspiration to the people of Liberia. Liberia, the country of freedom. The country of hope for so many who found refuge in it after the dark days of slavery. The connection of your country with the United States speaks for itself but so does the connection with Europe. It was the Dutch East Indian Company that was among those firms trading slaves from West Africa to the Americas. It has deeply affected the realities in your country. As you have, Marga Klompe demanded respect for the human dignity of all asked for all of us to carry responsibility for justice and peace, individuals, politicians, companies. We all have our role to play. As you are, she was a spiritual woman of faith, and like you, she was a pragmatic realist. And as you, she was and is supported by a strong, supportive, and loyal sister. Your achievements are no small feat. You have shown the world that women can lead, that African women can lead, that women can lead countries out of conflict, that women can play a pivotal role in bringing peace, in making peace, in keeping peace, that women are good economists, good financial analysts, good strategists, that women care as daughters, <laughs> that women care as daughters, mothers, wives, partners, and as leaders. In Europe, we look at your achievements and wonder, is this the new Africa the new Africa won the Nobel Prize for Peace in 2011. Europe won the Nobel, Nobel Prize for Peace in 2012. This surely provides a basis for a partnership for peace and prosperity between our continents. Madam, I congratulate you on your bold and courageous steps, which will continue to inspire the people of our continents to believe that peace is possible. Our dream has the size of freedom, indeed, but reality needs exceptional people with your courage and inspiration. By virtue of the authority granted to us by law and by the regulations of the university in accordance with the decision by the Doctorate Board of Tilburg University, I hereby promote you, Excellency Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, to Doctor Honoris Causa and bestow upon you all the rights that by law or custom are or will be attached to the doctorate. In evidence, I clothe you with the kappa of Tilburg University and hand you the certificate signed by the Rector Magnificus and the Honorary Doctorate Supervisor and reaffirmed by the seal of the university.
thanks and gratitude to the rector who visited us in Liberia and who initiated what we see today. I also express thanks to the executive board, the faculty and staff of Tilburg for the opportunity to join in celebrating this 85th anniversary of this institution. May you grow from strength to strength. You honor me by bestowing upon me, along with two notable academicians, Professor Emeritus Serpata Dasgupta, Professor Kido Dekaguen, the distinguished Dr. Honoris Causa degree, recognizing me for leadership and for my interest in education and social responsibility. I humbly accept this distinction on behalf of the people of Liberia. You in this room will be able to learn from our experience, will be able to take some of those experiences, no matter how difficult, in a research and analysis that will lead to interventions, that will lead to better approaches and policies to be able to preserve world peace. We all do so in the spirit of the visionary Margaret Plumpy as global citizens. And we'd like to thank Professor Dr. Marsham Van Rissen, the endowed chair of Margaret Plumpy on international social responsibility by contributing, promoting her legacy in favor of international human rights and justice, social welfare, and social responsibility. I thank you, Mr. Rector. Now we now move on to the panel, and um, I'm very pleased that the panel is in the hands of Kathleen Ferrier. She is a member of the Marga Klompe Foundation. Uh, she has also known Marga Klompe, and she will also be telling us a little bit about that. And uh, of course, uh, Kathleen, we are uh, honored for all the work that you have done as a politician that you are here with us today. I hand over to you. There's no walk walking um, Please, I ask the people from the panel to come forward. Dick Plessius, Anthony Ongayo Otiendo, Karin Sijinga, Regina Mankamba, Jen Peterson, and Arthur Arnold. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it is a big honor for me to guide this panel and to stand here before you on this very special day. And it is a big honor for me basically for three reasons. First of, call, of, of all, of course, because I'm the secretary of the Marga Klompe Foundation. And this is a, a day full of joy for us. Secondly, because as um, Miriam indicated, I have known Marga Klompe personally. She was a dear friend of my parents and she used to visit us very often and stay with us when I lived in Suriname. I was a small girl by then and I can tell you that Marga Colompe impressed my sister Joan and myself very much as little children. First of all, not only because she had this overwhelming and demanding personality, but because she smoked. <laughs> we as children were edu educated by parents who are very much against smoking. 
And there came this important lady from the Netherlands, a minister, and she smoked cigarettes. That was impressive to us. <laughs> but of course, not only that. What impressed us, as small as we were as little children, is the way she connected with the people of Suriname. Not as we saw many people coming from the Netherlands who came to Suriname and spoke with the people, telling them what was right and wrong and what to do to become really developed and successful people in their lives. No, she really listened and she had the attitude of wishing to learn also from people in Suriname, the former colony of the Netherlands. We stayed in touch. My sister Joan and I moved to the Netherlands to study and she kept on contacting us and following us. And she always said to us, as women, you have a specific task in life to show the strength of women. That was not so new to us because our mother told us the same thing. But Marga indicated as well that we, as children from Suriname, had a special task in the Netherlands to show our cultural background, to be proud of our ethnicity, and to be sure that we contributed to Dutch society also with the importance of our cultural background. And then I come to the third joy for me, to chair this fantastic panel. Because in this panel, you will see the international aspect of the work and the vision of Marga Klompe. So I'm extremely honored that all of you are willing to share your thoughts on Marga Klompe. Of course, we have a tremendous challenge because we have little time and here we have six fantastic people. Um, so I will firstly ask you, um, what does the view, the legacy of Marga Compe in your day-to-day -day work mean to you? And I will start with Dick Plessius. He is the president of the board of the Marga Compe Health Group here in the Netherlands. Could you tell us a little bit more about yourself, your work, and what Marga Klompe means to you? Please go ahead. Okay. Something about myself. I'm a professional teacher, and 35 years ago, I changed to the core of health business. And, and 20 years ago, I went to a special part of the Netherlands called the Achterhoek, the back corner, but it is really the forward corner, I can assure you, <laughs> especially on health. And, and when we uh, made the fusion of uh, several um, uh, institutions, we decided to take the name, and we asked the name of Marga Klompe. That was not because we were looking just for a name, but because we wanted to express our um, interest in human care, in values in care, in solidarity, in letting people know that we care for them and that we want to provide the best care they have. That's a difficult question, that's a difficult task, but with the support of such a strong woman, we succeed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, thank you very much. <laughs> Karen, Karen Sijinga, you are the director of Churches Health Association of Zambia. Please tell us a little bit more. Um, the Churches Health Association of Zambia coordinates the work of church hospitals in Zambia, and there are about 146, both Catholic and Protestant. And they came together, cognizant of the fact that they were all doing the same things. Whether they were Catholics or Protestants, they needed to have one office in the Church's Health Association of Zambia. But coming to your question, what does the legacy of uh, Maga Kofi mean to me and my organization? I think for me, sitting here this week, 
the work of Maga Kopei just reminds me and my organization that we ought to continue doing the best, what we know best to do in Africa. We ought to continue to continue caring, not just for the sick that need our help, but also for the elderly. And that's what we've done best. It is a reminder that we've been doing the right things. Rather, what we need to do is strengthen what we have been doing best. The second thing that m the work of Maga Compey reminds me of is that unless we can take care of people of all kinds, regardless of their political affiliation, creed and race, we will not achieve the Millennium Development Goals in Africa and in Zambia. We are not going to achieve the universal access. And until we do that, until we care for everybody, we can forget about the Millennium Development Goals. So her work just reminds me that we need to go on and make sure that everybody accesses care and treatment. Thank you very much, Karen. Regina. <laughs> Regina, you are the health secretary of Mangochi Diocese in Malawi. Can you tell a little bit more about your work and what Marga Klompe means to you? And perhaps you, coming from Malawi, can indicate also what we in the Netherlands might learn from your experience. Thank you. Indeed, I'm the uh, secretary to the Bishop of Mangoshi Diocese on health issues. Um, and also, I think I've not been saying this the past week, that I'm the vice president of the nurses, uh, the National Organization of Nurses and Midwives of Malawi. Um, as, a, as a health secretary, uh, I'm coordinating 18 health facilities in the three districts of Mangosh Diocese and also 15 community uh, health programs. In relation to the legacy of Maga Klompe, I feel that the best evangelization, I feel that we share with her that the best evangelization that we can provide or we can do to people is not only preaching on the pulpit, as she was Catholic, but to provide for the services and for the touch that the people are in need. Thank you. Thank you very much. That is a very clear point. Practice what you preach. Jen Peterson, um, your organization, Huairu, the Commission and Groots International is very well known, but perhaps you can indicate how you bring in your organization forward the legacy of Marga Klompe. Well, I've been just learning about Margaret Kampe, but I told people here I'm second generation from the Netherlands, so it's kind of coming home to sit here. This is kind of a coming back, and I came from uh, first generation Dutch people and my grandparents who really believed in community and always took care of their neighbors and always extended beyond their family. So what I've taken into my work, which is now evolved from, is focused on community driven work where I have been able to, with many other people, build a global organization that illustrates what we're talking about is that poor women are real actors on their own behalf and are the key component in their own, changing their own reality. And that with all the professionalization that we may do, we can't forget that we where we came from and how to make sure that the people that are in the communities, whether that we have to reverse calling people patients and clients and begin to see everybody, which I saw in that film just before, that everybody is a part of the solution and that we have to create new kinds of partnerships and relationships between the different levels of people involved in the caring sector. Otherwise, we lose care. Thank you very much. Otherwise, we lose care. That is a very strong statement. Arthur Arnold, Chair, Supervisory Board of the Dutch Development Go Organization, SNV. Could you please tell us what you, as a person and as an organization, learn from the legacy of Marga Klompe? 
myself. You should know that I, my life is all about diversity. Last night, when I looked at my notes, it started with cultural diversity. And then when I was thinking about Michael Compe, whom I have met as a boy, I'll come back to that in a second, I changed it. I changed it to human diversity. Because what I have learned, and I had to learn it the hard way, over probably something like 50 years, that human diversity is actually such a fantastic human good. And as long as we don't respect and tolerate each other, being different, we will never be able to succeed in justice and peace. And to me, that's something that Marga really personified. I must make a, I think, if Marga is up there on a little cloud, looking at us, probably with a cigarette in her hand, <laughs> and maybe even with a little glass of whiskey on the other side, <laughs> with ice cubes, because that's what she came to collect from our house when she visited our neighbors. They didn't have a refrigerator in those days, and we did. And then she came ba by and sat at our table in the kitchen, smoking those cigarettes, which they didn't really appreciate with at the neighbor, and asking for a few ice cubes in that little glass. But I think when she looks down on us here sitting, first of all, she would be extremely proud that you female are in the majority here sitting. <laughs> so much for gender, right? She would also be very proud, and some people know this, I, c I come to Africa very regularly, to see what the women of Africa have achieved. Just, you know, we saw the president of Liberia, the new secretary general of the African Union is a female minister from South Africa. How about you? Aren't you an inspiring example? The minister of finance of Nigeria should actually have become the next president of the World Bank. And she was almost there. Mm. Compare that, you know, to this huge other country, continent, Asia, China, where they just elected a standing committee with seven men for the next 10 years. So much about gender. I think Marga would be very proud that we are actually discussing care, where we all know what the dominant input is of you women. Thank you very much, Arthur. <laughs> Anthony. Anthony is a well-known expert on migration from Utrecht University. Please give us a bit of your insights on what the legacy of Marga Klompe means to you as a person and for your work. Uh, thank you very much um, for being here and giving me your ear. My first reaction is that I've become a student of Marga Klompe and it happened in, through a crush program at 12 o'clock in the night to 3 a.m program. It was baptism, uh, first communion, and confirmation at the same time. 
when Professor Van Rijsen asked me if you want to speak about the Maraclompe as a function in the board. I heard about her in the past, but didn't read so much yet. That same night I had to prepare a presentation. And that presentation was to be delivered in Dutch. It was baptism of fire. But when I went deeper into what I was to say, and to Dutch people who knew her, I was struggling for words. But at 3 a.m., I said, I will deliver what I pictured from her face. And the artist who made a picture, I talked to her in the office while she was working. And I looked at her face and thought about the issues that she represents. And I think Marka is a precursor of conscience at this moment. She's asking us to rethink our way of looking at life, our way of looking at people. As researchers, we are always busy with questions. The global challenges in Europe, in the Netherlands, and in Africa poses great challenge for researchers to provide answers to these questions. The questions come from very basic levels, but answers re are really from the very basic. Answers for big questions come from the street level, from the very low level. But that low level is the human person that Marga's uh, ideals ask us to rethink. In that sense, she talks about care. The care is about life itself. And that point is very critical because if we pay attention to the value of life as we see it, then we break all the barriers. Care is what life is about. If we do care, doing care, I don't mean do care, but doing care, then we have peace because people are happy. The cultural differences or cultural challenges that might be posed by foreign workers coming to the Netherlands, for example, will be addressed because if you care for someone, they won't look at the cow. A small child will be afraid of anyone, even if you look the same in cow. But the moment you come down to their level and offer the love and the care they need, all the barriers melt away. And these are the challenges that I think Marka has brought to us today to address the bigger questions that face our society as researchers, but also to listen, look at the past, really look at what happens today with an open mind, but also appreciating what is in the other. And that's what I take from it. Thank you very much, Anthony. Thank you very much. After this first round from our panelists, I take the conclusion that Marga Klompe, her legacy and her person, is an inspiration uh, to break through the boundaries of class, gender, and ethnicity, as was brought for, for, uh, forward before um, by Annelies van Heijs. I hear you all saying that. What I also see is the importance of Marga when it comes to connecting connecting people, connecting situations. Before we spoke of the capacity of Marga to connect people at the level of the Netherlands, but here I hear you talking about the capacity of Marga of connecting people internationally. That is very important to take forward to the next question I want to ask you. Because we are talking about the exploration of, glo of global mobility in healthcare. And as uh, Anthony pointed out so clearly, we are all challenged to rethink our way of looking at life because we have big questions being posed upon us in a world that is every day more interconnected. And uh, there are many big questions, but there is one question when it comes to care when it comes to challenges for an interconnected world that I want to bring forward to you because I know that in, at least in politics it is a, 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 a heated question and I'm curious to hear from you how you look at it. And that is the fact that uh, it is very easy 
um, for Dutch houses who need care, also for private care, to ask people from abroad to come and to fill in the gap that we have here. For that we need migration, for that we are willing to turn down a little bit the big boundaries that we are building up around Europe and around our uh, own country, the Netherlands. When we need migrants, they are welcome and we need them in caretaking and we will need them even more because we have to do with an aging population. But what does it mean, for instance, for your country or for your country, when we take away the, health, the people for healthcare, offer them a salary, as was pointed out by Minister Holland, that is higher than what they will ever receive in their home country. How to look at this? What is your vision? May I start with you, please? Well, what a complex question. I know. <laughs> because uh, my work involves coordinating hospitals and rural areas. So the exodus of health workers is not just to the worst. The exodus of health workers at country level is coming from the public, um, public health um, facilities or church health facilities to better paying jobs, international NGOs within country. That's one issue. But the more complex issue that we, you've asked me to, to, to comment is the exodus of healthcare workers to the West, to the Americas of today, to the Netherlands of today, to Britain, and even within Africa from Zambia to South Africa and so on. That is a moral issue. And it's not just a moral issue at government level. Both governments, it is a moral issue at a personal level. It is a human rights issue. Yeah. Um, in, the, in the 70s and the 80s in Zambia, uh, people moved. People moved. I, I, I also, we also went to Canada, I and my family. But for me, we decided to go back. We decided to go back for various reasons. Mm -hmm. To take care of the people who were aging, our parents, and also to contribute to that economy. But for the ma majority of our colleagues, they haven't gone back because they have a right to go where they want to go. And they're moving to the west for greener pastures. And for some, the reason they've given is that they can't make ends meet at home. Mm -hmm. And they can't help their parents or grandparents at home. So they've moved to go and get a bit of um, a better salary abroad. It is a moral issue in the sense that, at least for our governments, they have spent the meager money to train their doctors. And it takes seven years, at least for Zambia, to train a doctor. It takes three years or four years to train a registered nurse at home at a degree level. And after, after, uh, at the end of that training, and mind you, the training at home until recently, until the economy has been liberalized, the, the training has been by public, uh, by the government. So it's taxpayers' money, and people do leave, and they're not bonded, they go. And you're training, and they're going. You're training, and they're going. And the other complicated issue is at the training level, it's not enough intake, because the infrastructure would not accommodate, for example, more doctors to be trained, because you don't have enough residential, you don't have enough uh, boarding houses to train mm -hmm. more people. So the few that the government has trained end up leaving, and you have no way of putting a lid because it's a human rights issue. People have the right to move on for various reasons, and it is a moral issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dick, at, uh, at the Marga Klompe Health Group, you have this challenge. Tell me, how many people, from instant, for instance, from Africa are working in your uh, health group, and how do you look at this issue? Very easy question, zero. Zero. Yeah. Is that, uh, is that uh, on purpose? Is that uh, no, it is on purpose. Because something in your policy? We have enough people in uh, the Achterhoek to work with, but I think the, 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 the solution for um, our problem is that we have to rethink our own system, and we have to solve our own problems. 
and one of the big problems is that we have to bring care back to where it belongs, yeah. to families, to neighborhoods, and when we succeed in that, then we can help other countries, and we yeah. can help ourselves. Okay, help other countries. Um, Arthur, how do you look at it? What, what, what is your policy for uh, SNV? We work uh, predominantly with local people in all developing countries where we are active, roughly uh, 34. Um, if I get the, all the statistics right, of the 1,000 people, um, I think there are only 50 working in The Hague to, uh, today, and all the 900 out of 50 in the local communities there where SNV is actually able to connect people. That's probably the core competence of, of SNV. About your question, I'd like to suggest that we should come up with ideas how we can actually get these exchanges working without the moral issue that my colleague here uh, mentioned, um, becoming a burden, a liability. Um, there, is, there is one thing that I would really like to emphasize. Um, I think that Marga was also very much involved in that. I believe, I'm an optimist about the future, about globalization, because if I look at how the young, the next generation, is part of globalization, the impact of that is that all the hang-ups, potential racial, religious, and color, whatever you can think of, in the next 10 to 20 years, when they grow up and they take, start taking over, they will actually look at us as parents or grandparents. My grandchildren are already asking me, what's all this fuss about that you have as adults? What, 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 why are you, are you fighting about race, religion? And you know what, what really made that possible? And that's what I would like to put on the table as a challenge for those involved in care. If you look at the younger generation, they are constantly, instantly connected to the rest of the world. My grandchildren are already all over the world thanks to the communication technology. What mobile technology has done to this world it gives me enormous hope for the future. Now, why have we not been able so far to apply that mobile technology much more in care? There's a silence, because I really think that we should think about mobile programming for the elderly, yeah. for the aging, yeah. for being able to connect. That's one of the big questions we have to think about, but still today, we have to deal with the fact that was brought forward by Karen, that uh, people leave their country because they have big challenges and opportunities in other countries. Um, um, and that is really some, when it comes to salaries, for instance, eh, what could we do in having more communication, as you were pointing out, in solving such a practical problem? What is your experience in Malawi? Thank you very much. Um, like the first question that you posed to say, what yeah. does it mean for, 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 for Malawi? Yeah. Um, if there is migration, uh, in terms of uh, trade of the uh, medical services, uh, it would mean indeed less, less medical people in Malawi. Right now, we 
if we compare South Africa, Zimbabwe, Kenya, Tanzania, Zambia, Malawi is on the list, uh, like how many nurses pay 1,000 people? Two nurses pay 1,000 people. Uh -uh. Uh, yeah, two nurses pay 1,000 people, yeah, if I'm not mistaken. That is the situation that we are in. We don't have adequate staff to run our services. We have a lot of youths that could be trained. People fail to go to, into the university because we only have got limited space. University of Malawi only has got 890 spaces to take in all the, all the um, disciplines uh, that they are. So the spaces are not enough to train uh, the youths, but we have an untapped resource of youths. So it would mean less medical practitioners if we, if we encourage migration. However, it would improve the balance of payment. At this, right now, Malawi is in a crisis. Economically, we are challenged. No fuel, no um, forex, those are the issues. But if people would come and work here, then it would, uh, they would remit back the money to their relatives and then probably the balance of payment uh, of our country would improve. It would also improve the lives of, of, of themselves also mm -hmm. because living in Malawi is different than living here. So my life would improve on an individual level, which would be good. And uh, we see people doing business. People come, uh, Indians, Europeans do come to Malawi. But now there was a law that was put by the, I guess, um, UK or Europe to say we restrict movement uh -huh. of the um, medical people, of the nurses from Africa to, to Europe. And I was one of the people that was affected because it, has, it affected my movement to, to, to United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. They would not allow me to go. But then it affected me because I could not exercise my human rights on the wish mm -hmm. to, 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 to do what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So what we need um, together, we are talking, yes, of an exchange program. It is good, but it's, it is more of the exchange program. Right now, we need to plan for today if we really want to have this migration. Uh, train more people, help those countries, help Malawi to train, build universities, build colleges to train more people because demographically, we have 50% of our population as youths, which is, I guess, totally different from here, um, of which this, if these youths are trained, then they will be able to, to come here, then it will not affect the situation in Malawi. We will have enough and also we'll have uh, people migrating to support the northern countries. We need to develop strategy on how we can also prevent exploitation of the people who come here. We remember uh, backwards when there was slave trade, not saying that there will be slave trade, but the intentions sometimes differ. We may have good intentions, but as time go, as time passes, the intentions will differ, the understanding will be different. So we need to really put down exactly what we want in this. And the lastly, we also need to support the payments of, for example, the salaries. As, for, as, as the economics are not good in Africa, in Malawi, if because if, if the differences in salaries are different, very different, low salaries in Malawi, high salaries here, then there'll be more, there'll be a shift because everybody wants to receive the good salary. But then you need to balance, give them, uh, g provide Malawi with uh, some monies to boost the salaries of people mm. in Malawi and also provide good salaries here. Then there'll be balance and people will choose where to stay. Because I believe home is also best. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jen, you want to comment yeah. on this? Yeah. I want to challenge her a little bit. And I think, because I think Dick and I are probably on the right side here, is that, again, it's that we're not looking at what are we really trying to develop? Are we really trying to build a care economy? Are we really trying to build communities? Are we trying to use the people we have? Or are we just trying to, to professionalize and hire all the, the people to fill in? I mean, it really takes some thought here. Uh, you get what you put in. And I know we've already done the brain drain in the U.S. because people moved from the rural areas to the cities. And then we didn't have any of the medical people in the rural areas. And the United States then went to India and the Philippines to, to get people. In fact, we paid our medical schools not to even train mm -hmm. people because it was cheaper for us to go someplace else. But the fact is we've now specialized medicine so much that we don't use the caregivers. We don't work with the 
formalizing, recognizing people on the ground that are doing caregiving. So I think that there's a balance here. And I do think that on the human rights issue is that I went to school, and this goes to responsibility, which I heard, wasn't Margaret Campe uh, big on rights and responsibilities? Was that uh, the word there? Because if you go to school, like I did at a land-grant school in Wisconsin, and they, p they gave me scholarship to go to school, I was supposed to stay in the state of Wisconsin for four years to pay back to the state of Wisconsin what I'd gotten. So I do believe in rights and responsibilities, and I think we can get a, a balance there, but it still goes back to are the people that do the care, the hands-on-hands -hands care every day, formally recognized, given, given uh, uh, and become part of the global world that we're talking about. Do only doctors get to move around? Our doctors, thousands and thousands of doctors go from the U.S. to other countries all the time. They're doing medical work everywhere. I mean, thousands and thousands. Foot doctors, specialists go in, and it's amazing. So I'm saying we're a little, we're a little to me, quite not on the balance. But the fact yeah. is the grassroots groups never get to learn from each other and see from each other. So once they become part of the exchange, like we talked about Shirai, they're traveling now, learning from different countries. They don't feel they have to run away because it's not just running away to go and get the better salary. No. Most of the people, when they get the better salary, didn't realize what they were giving up. Yeah. And once they understand, and I'll tell you, I've met immigrants all over the United States, they want to get back home, but of they course. don't want to admit yes. how hard that life is. So yeah. I'm saying is that part of opening up globalization is letting, letting, letting people see what salary means, what leaving your country means, how you lose your family and community and you lose the culture, and then people have some real yeah. trades is all I want to put in. So I think that beginning to move the grassroots that are home-based caregivers around so they're seeing, they're exchanging. None of the people I know that we're working with thousands of people, I haven't heard anyone say I'm jumping ship and going to Canada yet. Yeah. So I don't know who's jumping where. Okay, thank you very much for this comment. Um, um, then we have not even uh, uh, been talking about the remittances, eh? what it means for the family and what it makes it impossible for some people who want to return home to go home because of the importance of the remittances. Anthony, as a uh, migration expert, how do you look at this? We have this human rights issue. People can go wherever they want to go. But what does it mean in our interconnected world? Uh, the, the most important thing is uh, uh, we are talking about people and, uh, and challenges that people face. So there are reasons uh, or factors uh, which are, can be push or pull factors or their motivations because we're talking about people dis making decisions based on di some motive, why they move from A to B. But before even we talk about the there's the individual, and we also have the context. So we have the African context, the Dutch context, and as Mr. Plus says, you asked him, but he says he has real stuff from other elsewhere. But that's the reality for now, because probably some parts of the Netherlands are still not connected directly to the global world in some ways. Although the food stuff, the global food stuff comes there. There's an Albertine shop there. So there's food from elsewhere coming there, but not the past meal. So global mobility has three dimensions. There's financial mobility, human mobility, and also products. Products moves very easily, is, is encouraged through business. Financial mobility is encouraged very well through the international institutions and infrastructure, and it is easy to m get moving. People is the most difficult to allow to move, and then people choose which people to, to allow in. Yes. So there are people who need safety, and there are people who come for other reasons. So also we need to make a distinction, and that's the political question also here. So the Dutch uh, uh, policy has always been receptive of people who need safety. From our study, we can confirm that. But once people have come here, what do you do with people you have admi admitted? So refugees are uprooted regardless of whether they have schooling or not. So if you accept refugees, you accept someone who was at a point in their own country and had not even integrated in their own context. So you move someone from point A in their own country and you want them to be in point Z in the Netherlands. 
a very tall order. But that's the reality. And then that person will be aged in the Netherlands at some point and needs care. But on the, in terms of the skilled people, uh, it might not be a need now, but some countries, she shows that there are needs in the US and everywhere. It's a question of the Netherlands going back to think of their needs. Zambia, Kenya, looking at their needs in terms of care and what kind of skills are needed. If you don't have it in-house, you look for it outside. Yeah. That's the logic in manpower projection. So you look outside for manpower supply. But the question is, when do you need it? For, ex for, for, for them, maybe not now. But the Dutch society might need it. And if there will be a need, where do you get it from? Exactly. And if you get it, how do you deal with it? And that's my point is that it is an individual choice also for those who come. Mm -hmm. And we know it's a reality that people will move. So my suggestion would be to really assess the needs and be realistic about them in the Netherlands. But say, if we want some external manpower, how can we let that manpower fit into our system so that we benefit? But the other question is, how do we benefit the individual who is coming and where they come from? And there can be mechanisms around doing that because there are examples of, of how this is happening. And we will talk about that later on in our workshop. Yes, yes. Uh, indeed, there is, um, this table brings forward a lot of issues that need further discussion. And fortunately, in the afternoon, we are going to have the workshop meetings in which you all participate and we'll have a chance to talk more in detail. Um, but before I make some closing remarks, are there things you want to bring forward now, still, before we close this panel session? Please go ahead. <coughs> Can lastly, I? No, oh, sorry. No, one second. No, you first. Uh, uh, lastly, uh, I just have a thought to say it's beyond uh, looking at the community. It's uh, looking at community care. It's looking at the society and looking at the uh, humanity. Uh, whatever is happening here, it's because of what we, we have made it to be. So we need to rethink on how we, we value. There's an issue of, uh, of, of, of family and the issue of having children, because it is the children of today that will take care of the people of tomorrow. So. Um, as a Roman Catholic myself, that is what I, 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 I will try to, to put forward to say, we need to rethink our demographics also because that is what makes our, our societies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Arthur, you wanted to make a comment also. I think it's extremely important if we really are discussing on the basis of equality, and I think that's the only basis forward in, in the global environment, that we are willing to learn from each other. And what I mean by that is, I'm sure you in Africa will organize your African way. But please learn from our mistakes. Because we did make mistakes. Also in how we were dealing with the people coming from the outside to the Netherlands or to Europe or to the US or anywhere else. And the other phenomenon that you are already experiencing, for instance, in Africa, is what we have seen in the West and what you now are seeing in Africa is urbanization. It happens in Africa as well, with all the challenges that come with it. And what I admire, and you're absolutely right, Your Excellency, about the value of family, also in the way it's taking care of the elderly and the position of the elderly. In an urban environment, that's much more difficult to continue. And that's the reality as well. And we should exchange our ideas, our experiences, and also our mistakes. Only then we can learn from each other. Thank you very much. I think this is uh, an important uh, statement you make. In the afternoon, during the workshops, we will talk more about these big questions 
that as a world population we are facing. And um, of course I want to thank you, but uh, before I thank you, um, I will say that what we take from this panel into the afternoon and in our lives after the afternoon also, is firstly what you have said is that we have to look beyond communities, look beyond individuals. But one thing that was what Marga Klompe was very strong is, at is to look at humanity as a whole and to have human rights, as you pointed out so clearly, are very important in that aspect. Secondly, the importance to learn from each other. I'm, I'm happy that it came forward so strongly. Learn from the mistakes of other. Learn from the way people in different situations solve their problems. The, the, the really willingness to learn from each other, which starts by looking at each other as human, being, as human beings and, and or as equals. And thirdly, something that I myself also find very important in the legacy of Marga, Marga Klompe is the value and the strength of diversity. And not only um, gender diversity, but also diversity when it comes to age, when it comes to ethnicity. Um, it is very often also in our own country an underestimated value and strength. And I think it's a challenge and a task to all of us to value diversity more. And so, uh, dear friends behind the table, I want to thank you for sharing so openly your thoughts with us. And I'm looking forward to continue discussing with you in the afternoon in the working groups. Thank you very much. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, again, uh, thanks to the contribution of the members of the panel, and thanks also to Ms. Ferrier for uh, her share. Ladies and gentlemen, we are coming now to the last item of our morning's agenda, and in former presentations, the links of Marga Compe to the world of international law and civil society have been indicated already. Those who have studied her legacy have seen many examples of this, and therefore it's appropriate that we focus on this legacy during this conference. And who is better able to do this than Professor Ernst Hirschberlin, former Minister of Justice and an important political leader in our country. Uh, thank you, Bim, for your kind uh, introductory remarks, and uh, thank you also, uh, 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 Kathleen, for the very important remarks with which, which you concluded the panel uh, session. Having heard so many inspiring and thoughtful contributions, I would like to reflect once more on Marga Klompe's mission and her message for our time, but from a slightly different angle. The warmth and depth of her personal engagement with the most vulnerable was not the only reason why we commemorate her 100th birthday. She was, it has been mentioned many times today, the first female government minister in the Netherlands. The mere fact that she decided to join the government is a statement in itself. Certainly, she was a charitable person, but her mission was not aimed at charity, 
On the contrary, she regarded charity to be inadequate, an inadequate answer to the needs of people and her mother, her mother did not want to be dependent on charity when the Clompe family had to face poverty during the economic crisis of the 30s. When Marja Clompe, immediately after the Second World War, participated in the work of the newly established United Nations Organization, the first initiatives for international human rights protection were taken. In accordance with Franklin D. Roosevelt's Four Freedoms speech, freedom from fear and freedom from want were part of this endeavor. Later on, people started to call these freedoms social rights, as opposed to the classical freedoms of belief, expression, and association. But certainly, in the framework of Catholic social thinking, it was essential not to separate these two kinds of freedom, classical freedom rights and social freedoms from want, especially from each other. How can we expect somebody who is struggling with hunger, who has no shelter, whose parents can't get treatment for their illnesses, and whose children can't go to school to be a citizen taking part in public debate and political life? These are moral questions addressed at everyone who exploits the poor or who looks aside. But these are also questions about justice. For politicians, parliament members, and government members, the needs of the poor should be a call of duty. As the Minister for Social Care, Marga Klompe presented a bill to Parliament that replaced the discretionary distribution of social benefits to persons without income into a right. The act that resulted from this, the Algemene Bijstandwet, entered into force in 1963. That was two years after the European Social Charter had been signed a treaty of the Council of Europe, which was regarded as the necessary supplement to the European Convention for the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms. But the European Social Charter was lacking the same broad political support and bold enforcement mechanism of the older treaty. Nevertheless, the European Social Charter was written in the same spirit as Marga Klompe's, and implied recognition of social rights as truly human rights. According to Article 13 of the European Social Charter, one of the fundamental rights recognized therein is the right to social and medical assistance. The contracting parties undertake to ensure that any person who is without adequate resources and who is unable to secure such resources, either by his own efforts or from other sources, in particular by benefits under a social security scheme, be granted adequate assistance, and in case of sickness, the care necessitated by his condition. I don't want to give the impression that the acceptance of social rights did not require special efforts in my country. Conservative jurists and politicians have never stopped objecting to social rights as part of human rights protection schemes. It was not before 1980 that the Netherlands ratified the European Social Charter signed in 1961. The revised European Social Charter signed in 1996, which contains the same provision, was ratified in 2006. At a national level, considerable progress was achieved, nevertheless, with the revised constitution of the Kingdom of the Netherlands of 1983. According to Article 20 of the constitution, Dutch nationals resident in the Netherlands who are unable to provide for themselves shall have a right, regulated to be regulated by Act of Parliament, to aid 
from the authorities. Since 2000, with legally binding effects since 2009, the fundamental right to social and housing assistance, so as to ensure a decent existence for all those who lack sufficient resources, has also been recognized in the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. And the same conservative politicians, sometimes in person even the same, who objected the speedy ratification of the European Social Charter, also objected the, European, the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union to get binding force. And the same politicians also objected initiatives concerning migration, with which I will be later in my speech. In all these legal documents, the institutions of the states are viewed as the guarantor of the social rights. And that is exactly what Marga Klompé had in mind when she presented the bill for the Algemene Bijstandswet. But is this view also realistic with respect to other societies, societies in other continents, with respect to social and educational deprivation, diseases, and poverty on a global level? No doubt, healthcare, education, and social security, protection of children, all these basic needs have nowadays been recognized as the object of fundamental rights, not only on the national and European level, but also on the global level. For instance, in the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights and the International Convention for the Protection of the Rights of Children. And these treaties are a solid base for international debate and international action to assist each other in the realization of these really fundamental rights of every human being. Supervisory bodies have been put in place by the United Nations next to assistance schemes through the UNESCO, the World Health Organization, the UNHCR, UNDP, and other international bodies. But whereas European states were already sufficiently equipped with the capacities and tools to deal with such problems before they were politically ready to do so, the lack of resources and the shortcomings of its institutional structure are part of the problem in many other parts of the world. That is why Minister Sekai Holland's remarks this morning were so important for us who deal with policy questions in our country, in our part of the world. And that is why the president of Liberia, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, in her address last week, when she received the, a doctorate honoris causa from our university, rightly emphasized the building of institutions as a crucial element of her program and the required inclusion of women in the transformation of the institutions. Amartya Sen, in his books, Inequality Reexamined and Development as Freedom, emphasized that hunger is mostly not the result of a lack of food as such, but of failing institutions. Addressing the problems of failed states, violent domestic conflicts, corruption, and unstable democracies has to be part of any sound program for international action. And that is again why Marga Klompé, in her decision to be part of the institutions of the state, also gave the right example for us in our time. This means that the international efforts on the problems that we discuss at this conference should be dealt with both by the governments and by civil society. Societal actors like NGOs, non-governmental organizations. Where states are failing or insufficiently equipped, the human rights of people in need are in danger. But human rights for the downtrodden cannot be realized by non-governmental organizations without legal, political, and administrative changes. That is true for providing health care and access to food and water, but also for the protection of children and women against abuse, 
for instance, in human trafficking, enslavement, and sexual exploitation. Therefore, effective action must be two-pronged from two sides. International action has to be part, a part of the international relations between states, but should also avail itself of the organized capacities inside societies. And from their side, non-governmental organizations should do their work, especially assisting people, but also uh, support the building of, infra of the infrastructure of the rule of law and democracy. The realization of fundamental rights requires both public power and civil society, non-governmental actors which contribute to a civilization of respect for human dignity. These non-governmental actors can be churches and faith-based and other idealist organizations, one-issue movements and institutes for education or healthcare, but also businesses which accept corporate social responsibility. Our understanding of human rights has developed in recent years in a way that was described adequately by an Australian scholar as civilizing globalization. Civilizing globalization. David Kinley, he is the Australian scholar, analyzes how human rights intersect with the trade, while and with the trade, aid, and commercial dimensions of global economic relations, taking the view that while the global economy is a vitally important civilizing instrument, it itself requires civilizing according to human rights standards. In three weeks from now, the World Legal Forum will discuss in The Hague the current challenges and opportunities in corporate social resp responsibility related um, conflicts between companies and communities. Ladies and gentlemen, I will conclude with a few words on migration, the field of policy for which I have been co-responsible for several years, and about which Anthony Onyo Ayo Otieno has made valuable remarks in the panel. Migration is a global phenomenon that characterizes much of the changes in the last decades of the 20th century and the 21st century, our century. Migration to urban areas is taking place on every continent. Towns in Asia, Africa, and South America have developed into cities and conurbations with populations between 9 and 16 million inhabitants. A size that in Europe is only mit matched by Istanbul and Moscow. When Annelies van Heist um, discussed the question whether or not it is good to have migrant workers in healthcare, a pilot came to my mind, a pilot uh, for circular, circular migration. My colleague at that time for development cooperation in the um, not the last, but the previous uh, Dutch uh, government, the last government uh, under the presidency of Jan Peter Balkenende, my colleague at that time, uh, Mr. Kunders, and my colleague in the Ministry of Justice, Mrs. Albayrak, and I um, decided to start a pilot project for circular migration. And the aim of that project was to learn whether or not it is possible to invite people from developing countries to come for a few years to the Netherlands and be part of the healthcare system and then having, um, um, having, having learned from their experiences, return to their home countries. This experiment with circular migration was unfortunately frustrated during the first term, the first um, uh, Rutte government, um, which unfortunately endorsed an anti-migration view on every issue, including the valuable experiment of uh, circular migration. I hope that such experiments 
such pilot projects will get a new chance after the recent change in government in the Netherlands. The idea that obstacles should be placed in the way of people wishing to marry someone from another country, part also of the government policy about which I made a few critical remarks, is not only a restriction on human rights, it also ignores the reality of contacts across large distances. What, um, what does need to be dealt with is the misuse of false mar marriages and marriages of convenience to circumvent immigration regulations, but not placing a negative sign on every relation between people from different origins. What we are seeing now is the repeated migration of people to urban areas, often as families. This movement arises from a growing group of people, many of them um, in their own way um, set apart from those around them. People who are able to make a difference by not eternally perpetuating the traditional rural lifestyle. They move to the cities in their own countries and sometimes they move to different countries, to other parts of the world. They are really exceptional people. The title that Goldin and his co-authors gave to a book on this subject. Not all of them succeed. Some lapse into crime after repeated failures. Others experience the problems of conflicting expectations. But many of them do succeed. It is up to the law to provide incentives and opportunities for those who accept an offer of integration and citizenship. So it should not impose requirements that serve no useful purpose. Fundamental rights protect people's identity precisely when it, comes, when it does not conform with supposed standards. And their previous speakers this morning were right when they said that diversity is a hallmark of global relations in which we recognize human rights and in which we grasp the chances of having people from different origins working together, for instance, in the structures of healthcare and, as it was put so nicely by Annelies van, uh, Annelies van Heist, fair care. As I said, there is no on-off switch for migration. But sensible politics must combine regulation and protection. All too often, politicians in this part of the world attempt to capitalize on misgivings on migration without offering any solution for underlying problems. People seeking shelter from prosecution, from climate catastrophes, wars, and economic crisis need and deserve protection. The 1951 Geneva Convention on the States of Refugees was a milestone for several reasons. Participants at the conference that drafted the convention were not only the representatives of governments and international organizations, but also civil society, represented by organizations like Caritas, the Commission of the Churches on International Affairs, the World Jewish Congress and the World Union for Progressive Judaism, and the International Union of Catholic Women's Leagues. The obligations under the Convention reflect the moral realism that one may expect from such organizations. States are required not only to refrain from expulsion or return of refugees, but also to assist the refugees in building a new future, give them rights, access to a job or social security, health care and education. Protection and assistance for refugees is part and parcel of the realization of human rights under threatening circumstances. Effective protection of refugees will also take into account that refugees need to be protected against exploitation, 
like extortion of ransoms and, or, and worse, one of the subjects of the afternoon sessions. Contrary to old legalistic conceptions of human rights, they can only become the guide for human relations when the forces of politics, religion, society, and economy, how different they may be, respect um, each of them, the persons, the human beings, dignity, and in this sense, work in the same direction. To work in this direction is a difficult and extremely challenging mission that has to be completed at different places in different times. Marga Crompe understood this and accepted it as the guideline for her mission. Today, we hear a concert of voices of persons and organizations, of people representing state authorities and people representing non-governmental organizations, faith-based organizations, other idealist organizations and one-issue movements, and individuals with different instruments who all take up their part of the same mission, doing justice to the downtrodden. I'm grateful that my voice is part of this concert. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ernst. Civilizing globalization is uh, an important term that encapsulates what we are uh, doing here today, and I think you have very well given us a frame uh, in which we can think about all these um, questions that manifest themselves at different layers and, and, and manifest themselves also here in the uh, audience itself. I was very um, pleased that you also linked in your speech uh, the question about care in the context of healthcare to the question of do we care and do we also care um, about those people who even fall out of these systems and which are um, bringing the issue of care and health care together with the issue of, uh, of trafficking and human trafficking. Um, the Maha Krompe Health Group introduced us to um, the university who, is an who has great expertise in the area of aging of Emory in the United States. And it was very interesting that at, uh, during the visit that she brought to the university, we were talking about aging and care. And she started to ask me about the other area of research that uh, we are engaged in on human trafficking. And I was wondering why is she interested in that area because what is the connection? And then she was explaining to me that in the context of the United States, uh, one of the big problems that they are now facing is the extortion of elderly pe people because of the uh, right that they have to uh, checks to financial uh, access. And these people are actually, just like we know it from trafficking in Africa, hidden in basements and, and, and in places where they are kept uh, for years sometimes out of, uh, out of social life. And then I asked uh, our colleague who is the human trafficking expert of our university, Connie Reich, and I said, I've heard that this is happening in the United States. It's not just an African phenomenon. Do we also know this in Europe? And she said, oh yes, surely we do. Now in Greece, one of the uh, things that is happening is that many families are living from the income of one pensioner. And the whole expo exploitation that happens in that context has very many similarities of trafficking. So one of the things that I've discovered in, in this journey is how some of these uh, areas really link up when we look 
uh, at globalization uh, and aging. And in that context, I also want to recognize one of our visitors from Turkey. It's an honor for us that you are here with us today. Um, I was uh, reminded a little bit of Marga Klompe in the last week. It was a very busy week. Um, and often very late at night, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the morning, I was receiving phone calls from your colleagues. And they were right, because they are very concerned with the refugees from Syria, and they were saying, you are having all these uh, gatherings, and can you ask attention for the problem of the refugees of Syria? And um, I'm glad you're here today with us, uh, and we, I hope we can meet further during the workshops today to also look at those uh, um, manifestations as we have to deal with them today, also in very concrete ways. I think that this morning program has been wonderful. I thank all the speakers and the audience for sharing in this. Um, this afternoon, there also is a very interesting program. I'm grateful for all the speakers and the leaders of the workshops who have given their thoughts in um, conceptualizing parts of the bigger question that we have looked at this morning. We are now moving from here to the Dante building so that we can uh, actually um, share the space where we now have the statue of Marga Klompe and take inspiration from that statue. Lunch will be served there uh, and some of our students will be asking, especially those who have not given yet their preference for the workshops, to uh, give them uh, the preference so that uh, we can deal with the practical arrangements for the workshops. And uh, with this, I'm very pleased to uh, close this morning session and thank you once again for being here.